All right. We're going to bring back Gonzalo Lira. You hear what he had to say about 11 months ago when he was on the show. I want to bring up something he couldn't say, but he could hint at, and that's this. You can see these listed here in blue on my Substack. You can click on those links and see what happened to these people, murdered, kidnapped, and so on. Volodymyr uh, Struck was a mayor in Ukraine. And they, you can see the duct tape on his hands. He was kidnapped and shot in the heart. They just murdered him because they thought he was a Russian sympathizer. Pro-Russian mayor of Ukraine City reportedly killed <clears throat> after being kidnapped from his home. And this... <clears throat> This happened more than once. So I've gone through the list that Lyra provided. You can see other people who were murdered. Dennis Kariv, they murdered him too. So after this program, please head over to my Substack. Uh, the link is on the top of Rumble right now. I will put it in Telegram too. I will put it on Odyssey too. And learn what Lyra was trying to say. He wasn't allowed to say it, but he was allowed to give you the names. And with the names, I was able to figure out what happened to each of these individuals. And I've placed them all on a list under least, underneath our old interview. Lyra was murdered. Whether they jailed him without any real cause and then neglected him medically neglected him until he died where they just beat him to death and blamed it on an illness. We're not going to know. They also extorted his money about a hundred thousand dollars out that we know of from the first time he was in prison, which is something that could still be prosecuted. They could say, Oh, he died in pneumonia or whatever. Where'd all his money go? Because he sure as hell didn't leave it to prison guards. It should have gone to his family, to his wife and children, or to his sister, his father, somebody other than prison guards in Ukraine. Well, Rumble, let's see. If you want to shackle chat, do it now, because I'm going to bring up Lyra in a few seconds. Yeah. Okay. Why is it showing this? There it is. All right. He was only 55 years old. Well, his Voldemir was only 57 when they broke in and killed him. There's Lyra. Had accurate reporting. I didn't know Lyra when he was doing his Coach Red Pill stuff. I knew him from his reporting on Ukraine, which was solid. And that's why they murdered him. It wasn't just that. It was also his reporting on the United States. But it wasn't just about the war. And it wasn't about Victoria Newland and Blinken and Sullivan. It was this list. They did not want him to talk about any of these extrajudicial killings. But I can talk about it because I don't live in Ukraine and I don't live in the U.S. anymore. And so I actually have the freedom to say this, just not on YouTube or Facebook or Discord or anywhere other than Twitter, Rumble, and Telegram. But here you go. Here's Lear. We'll do a lot of Greed Martin and then we'll get straight into Gonzalo. Reed Martin, proud producer of Happy Pride, patriotic projectile party poppers. Got some up in the brown people making trouble for your empire. Replace them with a charred freighter and a cloud of white smoke. So remember, if your next geostrategic boondoggle's going to ride, don't call us, we'll call you. We're making a Raytheon commercial too. 
Here we go. Here's Lira. Austin the Anti Neocon Report with me, Gonzalo Lira from Roundtable. A lot of his stuff has been banned. I'm going to let him tell you about it. But uh, he was Coach Red Pill. Yeah, he's got um, several different media outlets. Good to have you on the show. We don't do long intros here. We just get right into it. So people want to hear uh, what we got to say. So Good. you can let people know what you used to have and where you are now, because that's an interesting story anyway. No, sure. I used to do uh, Coach Red Pill because I basically retired in 2016. I got my fuck you money. And uh, in 17, 16, 17, I started doing a YouTube channel called Coach Red Pill because I wanted to do uh, content for my young son, who is, uh, uh, what, what, how old is he now? Uh, seven years old. He's going to be eight this year. And um, what happened was that, you know, I'm an older father. And so I figured I'd do videos that would serve him well when I'm a doddering old fool or dead. And, um, and yeah, the channel took off. I got like um, 340 odd thousand subscribers or something like nice. that. And then I was winding it down in late uh, 2021 uh, because I just got it. I hope I don't have to stress how dark that is. I made this for my young son. He's now eight. He was seven uh, months ago. So that he'd be able to see his dad. Hopefully YouTube won't erase it because the Ukrainians are still taking his money from it. But that's all his son's ever going to get to see of his father. But here in this interview, uh, he's talking about his son and why he did it. I'm glad I got this on film. It's dark, man. It, it, fuck Joe Biden. They, you know, to Israel something from Varg. If Joe Biden as vice president could go to Ukraine and get the prosecutor fired that was looking into the business that hired his son and was laundering money for the Biden crime syndicate, then Vice President Kamala Harris could have gotten Lira out of jail easily. Or at least put him in a different jail. Nope. Man, it's dark. I forgot he was talking about his children in the very beginning. Like, this is what it is. Because Lyra was, I think, 54 in this interview. He passed passed away. He was murdered at 55. And, uh, you know, he's a lot older than his kids. His daughter at the time was uh, 10 or 9. His son was 7. And he's like, yeah, I want, him, I want them to see me like this before I get, you know, too much older when they're older. He ne He didn't even survive the year. He was dead 11 months after this interview. Not even. 10 months and change. All right, well, I'll let him speak. You know, he was happy in this recording. Man. I'm tired of it. And um, what happened was that, uh, you know, the conflict here in Ukraine started off. I've been living in Ukraine off and on since uh, 2016. Mm -hmm. And because my wife is uh, Ukrainian, she's half Russian, half ethnic Ukrainian. And um, here in the city of Kharkov, I met her briefly. You know, I met her through uh, college friends. She was their au pair uh, in, Par mm -hmm. in uh, Germany when I was living in Paris. And I went to visit them and the same old, same old story. And um, we have two small children, but they are no longer here. They've been, I helped evacuate them. Um, and now they are far away from the conflict. They have no idea. Good. My kids have no idea what's going on. But I decided to stay for partly business reasons, partly because I was interested as to what was going to happen. And now I'm actually stuck in Ukraine uh, until the end of this conflict because I was arrested on April 15th because of some of my reporting on the ground of what was going on here in. Kiev originally because I was actually in Kiev when the war started and then subsequently I came back here to Kharkov and, and um, I was arrested on April 15th by the SPU, which is the state security services of Ukraine, just sort of like a combination of the FBI, CIA, all rolled up into one. And um, I was detained and, uh, and interrogated a few times and um, there was a lot of diplomatic effort because I'm a Chilean citizen. Uh, I they searched me, my apartment, everything, you know, and they took my electronics and they could obviously see that I'm not any kind of Russian agent. But uh, part of the condition of my release was that I had to remain in Ukraine 
Um, and so I decided that it would be sensible to stay in a place I know, Kharkov, which is out of the way of the conflict, of course. And uh, so I've been here, stuck here, since um, since then, since April 22nd. I can't, I'm like a, you know, a, a bug on flypaper. And so I've been just, you know, doing uh, geopolitical analysis and commentary and just... Uh, well, they seized the your war. channels, too, that you had built up before. Oh, yeah. To, yeah. Yeah, Important I had to start from scratch, uh, you know, <laughs> because I had um, two channels, uh, the Coach Red Pill channel and Gonzalo Lira channel, and both of those were attached to Gmail accounts, which they seized. And so I had to start from scratch uh, online. And, uh, well, you know, here we are. Uh, I've got a, a couple of YouTube channels, uh, The Roundtable and Gonzalo Lira again, that combined have something like, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred thousand uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. And I have a Twitter account, Gonzalo Lira 1968, which has um, 95,000 followers, I think. And, I just got uh, mine yeah. back. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Yeah, yeah so I've been I've been banned on all the above. I could never get my head above water. As soon as I reached even like 80, 81,000, they would just destroy my whole channel. I've been banned on Twitter for the last three years. So in a month, I've gotten like 37,000 in 30 days. It's not bad. Yeah, but yeah, you, you'll get back to what you were before uh, easily. It just, it's just a long as, and I'm obsessively tweeting because there is a very little to do here. Just the kind of irony is, uh, Lyra now has 177,000 be deceased, and so do I. Um, that happened to be on, on this day when he said, You'll be back. He was correct again. <laughs> just nothing really because everything's closed you know uh Wait, there are a couple no. of restaurants that are open um and uh, a few supermarkets but other than that you know the night so is here is not that great it's like australia, <laughs> yeah, I've never been to australia. no australia closed everything because oh, oh. of the virus so like, they have an eight o'clock curfew in some places it's like there's no war it's just panic over nothing well not nothing yeah but, i know yeah. i think that that's so pathetic to tell you the truth you know it is uh, it, it, I was living in Amsterdam, or not living in Amsterdam, I'm not sorry, correct. What happened was that I had a, a business deal that was going on in Amsterdam. And so I was um, flying back and forth between Kharkov and Amsterdam, you know, one week there, one week here. And uh, when, when this broke out, I was caught in Amsterdam. And uh, I was like, holy cow, you know, this is serious shit. And I was really freaking out. I was actually making inquiries as to how to get uh, a ventilator or two because I thought you know if you know a two or more of my family members are incapacitated because of this thing you know maybe it would be smart to have a ventilator I mean I was panicking like everybody because everybody was freaking out but what happened was that in April um, I would walk to my office every day because I figured well you know I'm just continue doing what I was doing right and uh, what happened was that I, I lived in the canal area in, 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 in central Amsterdam and I would walk to my office which was about a mile away and i would pass this area where there were junkies and homeless people and uh you know they were dutch junkies and homeless people <laughs> they give you confidence they are the, nice, they are the <laughs> nicest people man right i mean very very pleasant and very educated you know it was kind of weird to be talking to some you know full-on junkie you know and and he would talk to you very intelligently about all kinds of stuff and what i noticed was that uh, talking to them um none of them were dying and i thought to myself if this is a real pandemic wouldn't junkies and homeless people would be the first to be dropping like flies and they were like no perfectly fine and that's when i kind of like thought to myself this is bullshit. and mm. here we are you know mm. and when the vaccine came out in december of 2020 i was like "Fuck this shit. Uh, i'm not gonna take it uh for a simple reason because when i was growing up in the 70s i knew um um, I, mean, I didn't know them, know them, but I had seen uh, kids a little bit older than me who had suffered from uh, thalidomide and they had, you know, the, their little arms or their little legs, you know, they, they had been severely deformed because of thalidomide that their mothers had taken during pregnancy. And mm -hmm. that always struck me. I mean, obviously, when you're like four or five years old and you see a, a slightly older child with little flaps for arms, it freaks you the fuck out, right? And uh, later on, of course, I'd read up on thalidomide 
And it was a product of not enough testing because thalidomide is actually a very useful drug for certain conditions, specifically leprosy, by the way. But, um, you know, thalidomide given to pregnant women, you know, causes severe disruption in, um, in, in fetal growth. And so I thought to myself, well, that was not enough testing. And so they're forcing us to take this med medicine that has fast not been tracked. tested enough. Right. Fast track, exactly. So we don't know the long term effects. And then we like, still don't. Later, no. We, we don't know what could be coming a year or two from now from that. No, that's you know. not the issue. That's not the issue. I beg to differ. You know what I think is a real issue? Um, the the um, possibility of the, of the girls being born now with mothers who took the shot, whether those girls will be sterile. I think that that's something that we should really be thinking about and, and looking into. And of course, they're not going to look into it. But what's a girl? <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean that that okay, mental those babies that are... identify as girls. <laughs> you know, how do you how do you know it's <laughs> that is really something that with the shift away from biology to identity, and and then these are the people who like trust the science, and I'm thinking you're out there like Chicken Little saying the sky is falling. You got a fast track mRNA therapy. You don't know what it does. So, I was hoping yeah. for sterilization in the long run. It could be a net positive. So it's like, well, all the idiots ran wow. out and got vaccinated. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'll tell you right now, um, the, the, uh, the COVID, uh, Epstein killed himself, uh, the war in Ukraine, uh, the shot, they are all IQ tests. Think of it in those terms. They are IQ tests. Okay. And if you, if you pass the test, you're surviving. Okay. And if you were dumb enough to get the shot, if you're dumb enough to believe that, you know, the masks do anything, if you're dumb enough to believe that, oh, Russia is a terrorist state that started this war just because, just because they felt like it one day, well, then, you know, you're failing hey, the test. It's unprovoked and unjustified. That's what everybody said. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. For no reason. No, because, you know, Putin is that kind of a guy. You know, one day he wakes up, he says, you know, he takes a, a, a dartboard and he's got a map on the dartboard, just throws a dart and says, oh, I'm going to invade this country today, which is actually what the United States almost does. That sounds like John Bolton. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> John Bolton, just like, yeah. which new con was it that said, like, every now and then you just got to take a piece of shit country and throw it against the wall? I think it was Michael Ledeen. Uh, one of them. I, I don't know. That's a good yeah. line, you know, but you know, it, the funny thing is that I found is that whenever the West talks about Russia, it's all projection. They are projecting onto Russia what is in their own hearts. I think that's on which everything. I find, well, I beg your pardon? I think they project on everything. I mean, you look at like, okay, I'm not, a, I don't care about either party, but you know, Joe Biden, would they accuse Trump of having, doing a phone call to Ukraine, but he did a phone call to Ukraine. Right. Every, like all the stuff Multiple Hillary said, about, like, oh, you're saying they're spying on you were spying on his campaign. Like they're always guilty of their own accusation. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of projection. I don't understand that myself. You know, uh, um, it, it's just not something that I. But anyway, you're absolutely right, by the way, that whenever they say anything like that, anything outrageous without proof, it's what's in the, what they're doing. Yeah. Oh, it's, it, and when they start talking about nuclear weapons, that Putin is going to use nukes, no, it's because they're considering using nukes. That's what's going on. Because the situation here in, in Ukraine is catastrophic from the point of view of NATO. I mean, why would you use nukes in a war you're winning anyway? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. You know, it, it doesn't make any sense. You know, and this has devolved into a war of attrition. And uh, the Russians are just chewing away at the Zelensky regime forces across the board, not just in men, but also gear, in every weapons class, and not to mention in, in human assets, Ammo the, the proportion is roughly eight to one in favor of the Russians. For every one Russian killed, it's roughly eight um, Zelensky regime forces killed, you know? And uh, you know, the, only, the only part that's not that lopsided is loss of helicopters. It's four to one in favor of the Russians. But in other... Uh, weapons classes, it's like 20 to one. And so far as artillery is concerned, yeah. because the Russian artillery uh, counter battery is so good that it just, you know, the second they, uh, sometimes in the moment that the, um, that, the, uh, that the Ukraine forces fire an artillery round, as the artillery round is going, they are, they are already firing back at the, at the um, uh, uh, Ukraine artillery piece that fired. And it's that effective. And, it's and a lot of them are towed, so they can't move. They can't shoot and move. 
is yeah. like not that quickly. So a lot of the Zim K777s got annihilated right away. Oh yeah, yeah. And I yeah. guess they have they're, a few high Mars, but. Oh yeah, and the high Mars, the, the thing that is most despicable about the Kiev regime is that they're using the high Mars uh, to target civilian areas in Donetsk city. I saw a video of yesterday, the high Mars hit a hospital. I mean, a genuine bona fide hospital in Donetsk city and killed off four doctors and a bunch of other people. Mm. Uh, and that, that's just punitive. That's just, that's a war crime, quite frankly. And the thing is, see, the HIMARS, the, um, the, the, the uh, guidance systems have to be okayed by the by Americans. The US. Yeah. And so the Americans are complicit in war crimes in Ukraine. You know, the Americans are complicit in terrorist activities insofar as uh, the Nord Stream bombing, uh, you know, that was Nord Stream terrorist act. Uh, terrorist attack, rather. And so, you know, it, it's really just despicable. And, and Kirsch Bridge, my, my also, I guess that was the British, but I mean, the Israelis yeah, bomb six, hospitals in six Gaza. Of one, and yeah, six of one, half a dozen of the other. They're all the same cabal. Yeah. And yep. they're this unelected um, cosmopolitan leadership class that has <clears> deep <throat> ethno just this. religious, yeah, <laughs> deep <laughs> ethno religious hatred for Russia. And they want Russia just destroyed at all costs. Uh, did did Putin like, take you know, some of these cosmopolitan class and throw them out of the country and arrest them? Did he do something? I, I he thinks yes. <laughs> That's the thing. Uh, that, like Boris Berezovsky really or uh, Mikhail Khodorkovsky, these guys have something in common. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You know? they know. Everybody I guess they knows. identify as male. Is was that what they're all right-handed? <laughs> they're all right-handed. They're all right-handed. <laughs> Um, get a cigarette. I want to get something real fast. I want to show you something. You're going to enjoy this. I'll, it'd be like sure. less than a minute. Oh, I'm looking at your background while we're talking here. I see a picture of the Unabomber, Ted Kaczynski. Uh, yeah, I read uh, for the audience. I actually read, um, uh, industrial society and it's, um, I forget the name of the title. The, it's kind of incoherent, yeah, yeah, philosophical, yeah. you know, um, what, what was the name of Kaczynski's book? I we were talking about the IQ um, test. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you brought up this guy. <clears throat> I'll show some of this on here. Uh, I've actually mapped this out. With, uh, you'll see Epstein there in the middle. Oh, like, yeah. Yeah. This is like uh, almost four you feet long. You should post that. Yeah, you should post that uh, online. Like, oh, it is. A version of it. I sell oh, okay. it. Okay, then I'll, I'll so. be happy to, to post it around. You know, I sell that map so people can hang it up on their wall or whatever. Got a bunch of them. And well, I, I've got over all closure. the people on it, but it takes like nine hours of talking to explain that whole story. But yeah, I know. No, full disclosure about Epstein. Uh, full <laughs> yes. disclosure on my part. Um, okay, I have no memory of this, but when this conflict started, I, um, you know, after I was, I was detained, as a matter of fact. I was able to get back in touch with a lot of people, especially old people. I mean, not old people, but people I hadn't seen, talked to in a long, long time. And I talked to an old girlfriend of mine uh, that I'd been dating back in the uh, very late 90s, early 2000s, uh, when I had been living in Manhattan. Uh, and she told me that I met Epstein. And I'm like, bullshit. And she's oh, I remember very clearly because he was like a big deal and you were like blowing him off. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, because she was in finance, right? And I'm, I was a novelist, so I wouldn't know who was who insofar as uh, finance was concerned. And she told me, yeah, you met with him and you talked to him and you thought he was an idiot. And, uh, and I'm like, I have no memory of this shit, but I'm just saying this in case like Getty image, a, a Getty image appears somewhere with me and Epstein. I did not go to his mansion. Okay. I did not go to his, to his island just in case. I'm just putting it out there because, um, because God knows what can happen, but you know, no, and so far as Epstein is concerned, people don't seem to understand. They think it was a blackmail operation. It's a, it was a favor trading operation. It was kind of like the mafia, you know, you make your bones in the mafia, you know, you, you have a crime that everybody knows that you committed. So they have dirt on you and that's how you're in the club and they help you and you help them with, with favors that are small to you, but big for them. Well, that's blackmail that's it too. It's just not all sexual blackmail. They all assumed it's all, only honey traps. And it was like, no, it was a lot of white collar crime. And yeah. a lot yeah. of these guys, the Doug Lees, Glenn Dubin's, Les Wexer, these people were generations ahead of Epstein. 
some of these people, Jess Staley and Ace Greenberg, these people at Bear Stearns and these financial institutions, where they used him as a cutout. But him and Maxwell had ties to the Israeli state, so that was their their in. But they had been well, Delaney especially. Yeah. Oh yeah. Delaney, yeah. The Maxwell through, family through brought him in. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. We know. Yeah, because, so because, yeah. And so um, no, I, I actually think that Epstein was uh, middle management. I, I think that he he wasn't. He was just the the face, but not the real guy. I think Wexner's and Mossad they, they were the guys really running things. And Ghislaine Maxwell was his Epstein's girlfriend slash handler. And I think that that was the real relationship. Um, Epstein himself, um, uh, I have no memory of this, but you know, I, I'm pretty straightforward. And if I think that somebody's kind of like an idiot, I'll just. He's a con artist. And so, um, yeah. It's you can con certain people. I mean, I think he knew a little bit about math, so he impressed people like Eric Weinstein and all. But he just other people met him. Steve Pinker met him. Was like this guy's a moron. Like I met a lot, talked to a lot of people who met him in person and just thought he was absolutely full of shit. You know, and he'd bring like these girls with them and people like, what are you doing? Is that your daughter? Or what? <laughs> it was pretty bad. Yeah, but they did. Yeah, they did was... seem to target science and technology within the U.S., getting trade secrets and things. That was something that was they were after. Yeah, but uh, apparently they spread money around to a lot of very obscure people and, and small fry. I mean, it, the, the kind of they just spread it around, spread the cash around like yep. butter, like 25K here. Like would, yeah. Yeah, to see if anything would pop, you know, which is actually a smart way to trade. You know, I mean, it's, it's basically how you trade uh, uh, distressed bonds, you know, um, the bonds of companies that maybe or may, may not go bankrupt. And so their interest is really high. You just spread it around and see what, uh, what survives and the losses will be made up for by the wins. So they were I doing that, that at Tower story. Financial, but he was doing, they would set up like a subsidiary company to buy up toxic assets temporarily <laughs> that then would be bought back again later. But after the rating agency looked at it and saw, oh, it looks like you're not in the red, but they were real yeah. basic Ponzi schemes and stuff. But they got away with it because like it, <laughs> if you want to get away with the crime, involve the Israelis and the U.S. will look the other way. You know, he's right again. J.F. Garpley got $25,000 from Epstein. when he, I think he was at Duke at the time. They just spread that around like chumming for sharks. See if anybody will take that bait. It's pretty much how it goes. No, out. if you want to get away with a crime, you involve the um, regulatory agencies. You make them so part I just of the said. And yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> I set you up. Fair enough. <laughs> I was waiting for it. I was going to say it. Ding, ding. You got me. I mean, that's how it is now with FTX, right? It's like, look at, look at the regulators. They're oh, related. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. You look at Biden's cabinet. Friends, Bi you know? Biden's cabinet is pretty cosmopolitan, and uh, so is the entire government of Ukraine from Zelensky down. The, the prime minister, well, the president, no, it's, the defense it's, it's minister. It's a little more. Yeah, yeah, but it's a little more complicated than that um, because there, there's a, this contingent of real uh, neo-Nazis who are supporting Zelensky and his coterie. Although Zelensky internally has lost a lot of support, uh, you know, there's been this purge of, of uh, Zelensky, pro-Zelensky people. And I think that basically it was shot, a shot across the bow to Zelensky to not negotiate, to just fight this to the bitter end. Uh, because now in the West, they're, they're starting to very quietly tiptoe towards telling Zelensky, hey, maybe you, you should sort of sort like start talking to the Russians and figure out a way to wind this down because it's really hurting the West more than anybody. It, 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 the whole thing is incredibly surprising because at the start of this conflict with the sanctions and all that, everybody thought that, including the Russians, thought that the economic sanctions would totally tank the Russian economy. And a year later, they I are didn't. swimming in money. They are doing incredibly well. Yeah, uh, it, it's it's like it, you know you know uh, people Nassim got Talet it really wrong. Kind of like they, yeah, thought, yeah. they thought they thought the, like the, the sanctions. Asshole. They thought the sanctions yeah. were going to cripple Russia. They thought the Russian military is going to crush them in like a week, and it's been the opposite. It's like they've been crushing them, yeah. but they're not well, doing no, U.S. No, style no, no, where you just no, flatten no. a city and kill civilians. They're just going after the military, and that takes time. Yeah, but also. Again. 
Yeah, uh, I, on, on the Russian side, their strategy was actually a smart one. Uh, a lot of people say that, they, that the, military was, the Russian military sucked at the beginning, blah, blah, but their, their strategy was actually pretty clever to go in with a light expeditionary force and sort of like scare off the Ukrainian armed forces. And they did it on six fronts, right? On Kiev, Sumy, Chuyev, um, uh, Kharkov, uh, uh, and then in, in the south in uh, Lugansk, Donetsk, and, and uh, Kherson. And the thing is, see, um, in the north it didn't work, okay? But in the south it did. I mean, when you look at the map and you look at how much territory initially the Russians captured and held, because they, they did scare off the, the Russian military. In Kherson, uh, the Ukrainian military, in Kherson, the Ukrainian military abandoned the city on the very first day, you know? And so that's why the Russians were able to capture all that territory, including the city itself, okay? But what happened was that in the North, that strategy was not effective because the Zelensky regime, uh, which almost came, I mean, they came within a whisker of signing a peace agreement, a ceasefire, back in late March, early April, um, had it not been for Western interference, uh, that peace deal would have been signed and the Russians would have withdrawn and that would have been that, you know, and that would have been the end of the war. But it was Washington that pressured Zelensky to fight to the last Ukrainian. And so here we are. We are fighting to the last Ukrainian. And this is a, it's a catastrophe for the country. Yeah, I, I, I feel, you know, you can't understand the amount of sorrow I feel for the collapse of this country. It's horrible. Because Ukraine is now, uh, what, has, what remains of Ukraine is roughly half the population it had before the conflict, okay? And so it, this is a catastrophe for Ukraine. Even if there is a ceasefire right this second, the, the Ukraine that remains will be a broken country that will never survive. Yeah. Speaking of that peace agreement, well, they didn't get it, but it was like late March. It brings me to the story yeah. of uh, Denis Kariv is uh, someone you've listed on your Twitter, actually, because there are yeah. a bunch of extrajudicial killings. Um, can you talk about him or some of the other people? Maybe Volodymyr Struck is another guy. I believe they off. He was a mayor. I'm not going to um, talk. I'm not going to talk about them specifically, um, but I, I have listed their names on the on the pinned tweet on my Twitter account. I'm not going to discuss them because is this if I part of their. Them, you can't. Yeah, I'd, I'd get into. I, I, I'd be. I, I, I put myself in a vulnerable position. All right, don't do it. I'll, I'll do it when you leave. Or, no, no, no. I, <laughs> like, I, I want to give. No, I want to give a full explanation because see, I was arrested, and um, and so because of this, you know, I can't talk shit about certain local law enforcement officials. But that doesn't prevent you from finding those names on that pinned tweet and Googling them for yourself and finding out what happened to each of them, okay? So I'm not going to talk shit about the, uh, the authority under which uh, I am, uh, uh, you know, currently here in Ukraine, in Kharkov. I'm not going to talk shit about them because it would just make my position extremely vulnerable, obviously. But I'm not going to hinder you, uh, the viewer, from finding out yourself. And so you just go to my Twitter account, go to the pinned tweet and Google each of those names and you'll get a full background as to what happened to each of these individuals. And by the way, the, the information you'll find is Western sourced media that will give you a full picture of the fates of each of those individuals. Yeah. Fair enough. There you go. So I won't say it either because I don't want to mess with your freedom so <laughs> just you guys can google it if you're too lazy to google all the names i will sub stack it later i've i think i have talked about most of these people at some point anyway but that's the thing this okay so we get this neocon regime again and the rhetoric in the media is all unprovoked and unjustified it reminds me of too big to fail like they have a little catchphrase they have to say over and over again and some people have done a good job, like Douglas McGregor, Larry Johnson, uh, Andrei Makhyanov, the uh, you know, talking about, hey, Pep Escobar is another one. There was a coup in 2014. You know, <laughs> our, our, remember that? <laughs> that remember fuck and, the EU? <laughs> yeah, fuck the EU. Well, that's the only part I agreed with, but um, <laughs> for oh, different yeah, reasons. But yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, there was a blatant coup, and the eastern yeah. half of the country did not accept it. 
They say, hey, yeah. we don't want to have yachts in the Confederate Cinco. We, you know, they we don't believe this was a legitimate election. They walled people up, set them on fire. It was a horrible, violent coup d'etat by yeah. people who are now in the U.S. State Department, the second highest level, the highest level, and the highest level of the NSA. The same people that decided to blow up the Nord Stream line, Blinken, Sullivan, Newland, same same right-handed Eskimo or whatever, decided to do that. Right-handed Eskimo? That, was it, is, is that what we're calling them Well, now? there's a coup in Ukraine. <laughs> they want to keep, they keep etching NATO eastward towards Russia. But why? Why not just be friends with Russia? They have lots of oil and gas. We should be trading with each other. It benefits everybody. What is the big division that they're so adamantly against Putin in particular that they're willing to risk a nuclear war or at, or at least a massive it's war ancient, against ancient and ancient uh, ancient ancestral hatreds. Mm. You know? Look, I, I, I can speak uh, from experience, okay? Because uh, I'm Roman Catholic, of course, from Chile. And uh, one of my ancestors was uh, Jose Miguel Carrera, who was the first president of Chile, a, a great leader, and he was betrayed by his political opponents. And to this day, our family is very adamant that we not socialize or interact, let alone intermarry, with the descendants of the people who betrayed him. And we look at them with contempt and, and, and you know, Growing up in school, you know, it was perfectly acceptable to get into a street fight with these assholes, the descendants of the men who betrayed my forefather. And this happened 200 years ago. Actually now, I mean, it was in the 18 teens, 1821, that he was assassinated. And so, you know, 200 years and we still hate them, okay? And so uh, the, the ancient ancestral hatred of, for instance, Victoria Newland, her grandfather was persecuted in the 1907, uh, no, 1906 pogrom in Russia. And that's why he emigrated to the United States and he carried his hatred of Russia with him. And it just went down a couple of generations. And here we are with Victoria Newland, who has a hard on for Russia, you know, because she identifies as a female, but we're not sure <laughs> you know, what she was biologically. Her, you know? her and Janet and so Yellen she, are both she, goblins. Yeah, they, they, they hate the Russians. And you look at the family history of Anthony Blinken, Janet Yellen, uh, uh, Wendy Sherman, and, and Wendy Sherman sounds such a, such a waspy name. It's not, you know. Uh, you know, you, you start looking at them. Jake Sullivan, at their family too. history. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, Jake Sullivan, I don't know his family background, to tell you the truth. But he doesn't look like a, a good Irish boy. He's, um, he's cosmopolitan. Oh, really? Yes. On which side or both sides? Uh, I don't remember that, actually. I think it's both sides. But he's he's okay, uh, really he's on the he's of a particular tribe. And you see, like Putin basically saved Syria. Uh, he's worked with Iran, still working with Iran, kicked out a lot of these um, oligarchs, some most of whom fled to the UK or Israel. Some did go to Ukraine. Some were always in Ukraine when, since the yeah. Soviet times. There's a guy uh, who I've heard you talk about is sort of the, if there was a Boris Brzezowski equivalent, or I, I akin him to the Bronfmans of Canada, it's Ihor Kolomoisky. And yeah. through a bunch of holding companies, if anybody wants to see the whole paper trail, it's on my sub stack. But that was the owner of Burisma Holdings, which had hired Hunter Biden and Kofor Black and a whole bunch of snakes, right? Devin Archer yeah. and all these people. You get very little news about Kolomoisky. Um, very little, yes. And it's Although amazing because he right he was appointed governor. Several yeah. cosmopolitans were appointed governor of different regions of Ukraine. And it's just the most corrupt country in Europe, maybe the world. Nigeria, yeah. Ukraine is one of those. Pretty damn bad. There were 15 billion euros in debt back in 2014. They lost Crimea through secession, a referendum. And that's another one they all were like, oh, yeah. the Russian invasion. I'm like, what what, what bullet was fired? What tank? What plane? They just left. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> but they built off that. Now these, uh, like, okay, we'll call them blood libel, revenge, hell-bent on revenge, families, whatever, made it into the Biden regime. 
But even during the Trump regime, there was sanctions placed on Russia. Everything was blamed on Russia. Hunter's laptop was blamed on Russia, 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 everything. Russia. Flynn lost his job, supposedly, over Russia. Yeah. <laughs> but that's you know, not what happened. That, you know, the, the thing that tipped me off that there was a, a deep cabal in the United States against Russia was in the uh, 2012 election. Um, you know, Mitt Romney was running against Obama. And at some fundraiser or something, you know, uh, somebody saying uh, somebody asked Mitt Romney or said something about Russia that Russia is not important and and you know we should be focusing on other stuff. And Romney said something that I that struck me as weird. He said, "Oh no, my friend," and he used that phrase. "Oh no, my friend, uh, Russia is much more important, and we have to focus on Russia because Russia is the new enemy. It was the coming enemy, or something along those lines, you know." And I thought to myself, "Russia, you know, come on, what are you talking about?" And now, retrospectively, I'm like, oh, I get it. This, this program to go after Russia indirectly by way of Ukraine, this has been on the pipeline for a long, long time. And th th this is not a spur of the moment kind of plan. And, it was supposed uh, to be 2017. And we know that because, made, but, well, yeah, yeah, you know it because, first, well, they all thought Hillary was going to win, but right. we had the patron saint of neocons john mccain there with uh deep in the closet lindsey graham lindsey hey, graham. hey john hey, hey john how's it going I, i'm <laughs> waving at him down in hell you know i have a holiday actually you'll love this so i make a calendar with john my, was a my japanese girls pussy. every year but um yeah, I, on you know he was a coward and a pussy and, and he was you know he, he was not a great war hero he was a pussy and he was an incompetent and he was a hysteric i i hate john mccain that that guy he really should be rotting in hell no well, they I'm put sorry. the I, I they put the flags at half mass for al-qaeda when he died um let's see yeah there it is so i don't know if you can see this John McCain Day. Uh, John McCain's I, I anniversary, and it's the same day that Rittenhouse <laughs> dropped three communists, right? That's <laughs> like, no, yeah, yeah, no, he's, he's just really nice, Mr. August. Just, there, just, y'all should get a calendar, not because you need to know yeah. the day, but so like a this day in history kind of type of thing, and um, except truthful. And we every twenty fifth of the month is the month anniversary of John McCain's death, and then of course August twenty fifth is when he died. Bonus every Christmas is a month anniversary of his death because it's on the 25th. <laughs> so he picked a great day to die. But John McCain and Lindsey Graham, who's so deep in the closet, you can see Narnia in his rearview mirror, went to Ukraine, met with his soldiers, and was and they quote Lindsey Graham, 2017 is going to be the year of offense. They were ready to go. And then Hillary didn't yeah. win, and it didn't happen. Yeah. And they were like yeah. so pissed at Trump. Oh, he's a Russian agent. Blah, blah, blah. Why? Because he doesn't want to go to war with Russia. They're ready to go. Yeah. And apparently in March, Ukraine might have been going to invade the Donbass anyway. So they got pre oh, yeah. in February. That's, that that was true? a trigger. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Because the uh, Zelensky regime had assembled something like 100,000 troops uh, on the contact line at the Donbass. They were getting ready for an offensive. And they had started shelling uh, Donetsk. Uh, increasing shelling because they've been shelling since 2015, but they really stepped it up right before the invasion. And that for um, the, the, the Kremlin was the signal that, yeah, this, this is coming and there's no way out of it. So we just might as well beat them to the punch. And I think that that was the, the calculation that, that they had to beat them to the punch. And so to say this war was going to happen anyway, because Washington instigated it. And what is just so funny to me is that this is all gone tits up. It's gone exactly the opposite in every respect. It is just so funny. I mean, like there's that saying that, you know, man plans and God laughs. God damn right. You know, the, <laughs> the neocons, they thought they had the foolproof plan and they just blew up in their face, you know, and the Europeans, man. I mean, can anybody claim that they, the Europeans are sovereign at this point? They are just vassal states. And Especially Germany. Germany, man, Jesus. I, and the thing is, see, I'm I'm almost half German. I'm three eighths German. My maternal grandmother was uh, German Danish from the region of Schleswig Holstein, and my other grandmother was half German. Okay, and so uh, you know, I'm basically three eighths German. And I, 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 you know, and I lived in Germany. I lived actually in uh, Schleswig Holstein, in the town of Flensburg. And so 
you know, I look at what has happened to Germany between the mass migration of 2015, which I saw and I was horrified by that shit, and uh, now them destroying their own economies. I'm like, what the hell? What happened? And then you start to think to yourself and you realize that the Germans have been propagandized into self-hatred to the point of suicide. And it's, it's yeah. because the, the cultural hegemony of the United States controlled by certain people who have, again, ancient ancestral hatreds towards Germany. They really just ground down the German spirit. And, you know, Bismarck would not recognize the German people of today because they are pussies. They're all cucked out little bitches. And it's, it's just so it's weird because they have so much guilt from World War II. Like I live in yeah. Japan. Uh, Japan did some really horrible stuff in World War II also. But they don't walk around mm -hmm. with guilt about it. Like I didn't do it. Yeah. That's that. But then again, uh, the Koreans don't own the media. Good point. Exactly. Exactly. See how close so, to the sun yeah, I can these... get in this interview. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but no, I'll tell you that, that it, it's, it's so obvious. And when you point out what is obvious, you get immediately canceled. Look at poor Kanye, right? Uh, you know, it, yeah. it, it's basically, you know, how dare you point out that people have uh, too much power. So we're going to use that power to destroy you for speaking the truth. Basically, there's a meme floating around. I'm not quoting it correctly, but it's basically that, you know, well, uh, is it the one where he's on the phone with Mel Gibson? Have you seen that? Oh, no, I haven't seen that one. How's it go? No, yeah, it's a lot. you go find it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even enough. You know, it's it's too hot even for Rumble. Oh, that's uh, cool. Actually, yeah, it doesn't matter. We're not on YouTube. Let me let me pull it up so I can get it perfectly, though. Let's see. Oh, that would be it. great. <laughs> uh, but like, man. look, like Eric Weinstein actually blocked me a couple of days ago uh, because I just simply pointed out in some video clip of his that he was basically saying that, uh, you know, you're free to say whatever you want, but uh, you're going to get canceled because of it. And so, you know, I just pointed this out and he just threw a hissy fit and blocked me like a little bitch, you know, because I blocked NAFO, I, I, you know, the, the North Atlantic uh, yeah, organization, yeah. we're just a bunch of organized trolls run by the, by the uh, Air Force. And, uh, and I block, you know, some obvious assholes that are just trying to get a rise out of me. So I just block, you know, I mean, guys who are like spamming and shit, right? But I don't block anybody that I really despise. I even follow some people that I really despise. But Eric Weinstein, man, you know, it, I find him very funny because he keeps trying to push this weird, um, you know, like he, he, he wants to set himself up as his next Einstein, right? And he claims that he has this, this new theory that explains all of physics. No, it doesn't. And like, you can't explain it. And I saw some video made by some I've, I've had on like Sabina Hosenfelter and it's like some real brains on there. And it's like, yeah, Eric Weinstein is a good, a great mathematician, but TEU, like, come on, dude. Like you're just snowing people like Rogan and stuff. You can snow people like that. You're not gonna snow uh, um, theoretical physicists and things. They just look at that going, dude, no, man. Like. There's so many problems with it. But <clears throat> anyway, I just did a video yesterday. I was like replaying because I just got back on Twitter and stuff. So people miss all this work. So I'm with Sean Atwood and he had this video he's of very, Weinstein. I really he, like it. Yeah, he's yeah. cool. He had this video of Eric Weinstein asking these questions about Epstein. And the thing is, like, you know, he fucking knows, right? He, oh, yeah. He talked about Eli Cohn at the very end which was a spy that set up honey traps for Israel. I'm like, man, he knows. He goes, some, they said it's some intelligence and it could be the country I love most. <laughs> like the two countries I love most. So gee, why, which two are those, buddy? <laughs> like he was so, like, you know he knows, but he wouldn't say it. So I went on that one and answered all the questions for him. I also predicted where Glenn Maxwell was hiding. I said, she's, in the, she's still in the US, she's in the Northeast, she got married, blah, blah, blah. He's been following this stuff forever, but it's weird that I that happened with Eric Weinstein because I just replayed that video of his questions. That no, it was today. Sorry, it was this morning. <laughs> I did a different Atwood yesterday. It was today. I replayed that video about Eric and I answered all. I answered all his questions. You know what happened? All my videos with Sean were removed from YouTube, and he lost his whole channel. But he got it back under the condition that he removed certain videos which was all the videos he had with me <laughs> which sucks 
and then you know my whole channel was gone but eric weinstein definitely knew the answers and he met with epstein before i thought he was really weird oh, yeah. but um he won't say it no no, no the, the fact that just because somebody meets with the guy in public that doesn't mean nothing but it's just like i'm putting it out there someone's yeah. like didn't he meet him like lot look there's this fake list going around it's got all these celebrities on it like tom hanks and blah 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 like look they these they didn't have anything to do with it and just because someone is in a picture with them or met him at a party doesn't mean anything they they did use that Terramar oceans as a means to get maxwell into the un so she could rub soldiers with shoulders with all those important people try and get them compromised one crime or another which doesn't always mean sexual blackmail be whatever they're doing all kinds yeah. of stupid financial crimes but she got in there um but it kind of makes me mad when people like weinstein like lead a horse to water and don't i'm like just just tell them man just tell them they're tied to the israeli well, state it was really interesting i i saw an interview with eric weinstein once with some guy who had a fairly small YouTube channel. So um, Eric Weinstein was really arrogant and dismissive of the guy uh, mm. because Eric Weinstein is one of those people that if, if he senses that you're bigger than he is, he's very differential and respectful. I mean, look at, look at when he goes on Joe Rogan, she's like, oh, you're so great. But when he's talking to somebody who he perceives to have a fairly small audience, he's just really dismissive and, and just like, just like, oh, you little hoi polloi. Which I find so despicable because I am a man of one line. You know, I I try and make the effort to treat everybody the same. If you're a small creator and you're on the ball, I'm going to respect you. If you're a big creator and an idiot, I'm just going to. Well, I, I, I mean, there's a lot of people it. that have a big channel just doing Jerry Springer stuff. You know, it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, exactly. some but people anyway, have a big channel because they've been grinding at it a long time. But there's a lot of people that would have a big channel if they weren't shadow banned or outright banned all the time. I mean, yeah. we found that out with twitter you know they did it on everything else oh yeah, yeah, yeah. you know they're, it. they're doing it with everything yeah. it's like oh i, I mean i remember Fred sitting Bell, at i i, I yeah, sat at fifty five thousand for like three years i'm like i didn't get any followers mm -hmm. for three years i doubt yeah, it. <laughs> yeah. well no the, the point i wanted to make is that see eric weinstein he was on some show and he was talking about epstein and and very frankly and and, and he pointed something out that I, I realized oh yeah he's absolutely right which is that see um uh, Weinstein was saying how Epstein lived this life that was not commensurate with somebody who had a couple of billion dollars in assets. No, like because he had like the, the, yeah, because he had like um, the house in Palm Beach, the ranch in, in New Mexico, the island, the plane, the mansion in New York. The Paris All property. that stuff is yeah. extremely expensive to maintain. And you know, people think that if you're a billionaire, you have that money cash. No, you don't. It's parked in assets, and those assets don't necessarily produce that much income. Uh, and so, you know, the kind of lifestyle that he was living was not the lifestyle of a man who had a couple of billion in assets. But if somebody was financing that, somebody Wexner. bigger, oh, then then yeah. yeah. Now we're talking. Well, see, that Wexner group goes back to the. I don't know how much you know about the Sunborn Institute, but like there was a. Before the mega group, which is just the mega donors, that's the second generation. There was one before that in the 40s and 50s that helped steal uranium, do all this other jazz. But Wexler's one still, of the guys I'm, that's oh, it's okay. I'm still, I'm still still here. I'm just gonna go ahead and freshen up my coffee. So go ahead, please. The Ukrainians got them. No, they I'm, got them. <laughs> lights, yeah. lights went out. I guess the rush is on the offense. Yeah, it was um the Wexner Foundation was set up by people involved with the Jewish agency and, and uh, weapons smuggling a long time ago. And so these people helped finance weapons theft at the beginning, but then later human trafficking. But not mm -hmm. for sexual blackmail. It was just trying to get a Jewish majority demographic in Palestine. So they were smuggling people from all over the place. Operation Magic Carpet, for example, out of Yemen. Da, 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 da. So... Wexter's one of the people that was sort of young when the first group was going, and he's really old now, right? There's a couple guys, I'd put Steinhardt in that boat too, that overlap with uh, both generations of this ring. And they're the ones that finance people like Jeffrey Epstein or, mm. you know, Peter Nygaard or these people like that. There are some billionaire perverts and all, but Epstein was, that wasn't his own money. Like he was given a house, oh, no, no, no. he was given yeah. a school, really. It was like <laughs> that old, it used to be a school. He was given that mansion that for a dollar or something. I mean, it was Les yeah. Wexner's money, but Les Wexner himself, uh, 
is related to with the Schottensteins and all these other billionaires, and it's working on the behalf of a state. I mean, this was a state intelligence operation. And the Maxwell yeah. family's deeply tied to that. There, Robert Maxwell is the one that blew the whistle on Mordecai Venuno. <laughs> And Mordecai Venuna is the one that blew the whistle on the weapons procurement and nuclear weapons that the first generation mega group had helped create and steal. That was with, you know, yeah. Raphael Edenton, Zalman Shapiro, these people. They stole uranium from the U.S. They illegally built weapons. Venuna blew the whistle. Maxwell blew the whistle on him. They And guess how they got him? They honey trapped him. A girl named Cyril or Cheryl or something. They honey trapped him, put him in solitary. So that's the Maxwell family and, you know, Gwen's the dumb one that compared to her sisters who are legit, you know, they're smart. I mean, they made the Magellan software. They're spying on the Pentagon. Now, what, what's this whole thing of, of Ghislaine being one of the biggest Redditors, Reddit editors? Yeah, what, I heard she was like number three. I don't for, I I think Reddit's cancer, so I don't know what people were saying. When she got um, jailed all all those posts stopped and it was clearly her it was like her name had max in it and so these people know how powerful media is and so yeah. they were trying to make a search engine on the internet you know google went out but the maxwells had tried to make create that early on in the early days of the internet with the Trellin. and then um she was in reddit and they're also related with uh, Elizabeth Johnson from Johnson and Johnson that make the vaccine. Mm -hmm. They had bought some properties together and stuff. It's a complicated story, but it's similar kind of crap going on in Ukraine. They have their own oligarchs and their own network. So I'm bringing it back to Ihor Kolomoisky. Um, tell people a little bit about this guy. Now he's been distanced, you know, even the U S like supposedly, a anti Kolomoisky all of a sudden. Yeah, he's on the shit list right now. He yeah. he is. Um, but he got to a point. I mean, Epstein finally got on the shit list too when the Epsteins and Kushners were fighting with each other, and then Kushners uh Kushners <laughs> buried in the Trump family and his father in law became the president. So <laughs> didn't see that coming. <laughs> but what no. happened with him? He was like with you are yeah, third you are richest, I think. Kolomoisky. Yeah, he was like the yeah, one of the richest oligarchs in Ukraine. Uh, he is a um, Ukrainian Israeli Cypriot national. He's got those three passports. And and in Ukraine, you can't have two passports, right? You can only have the Ukrainian passport. That, that's the law. But he said, well, he had three, and the law doesn't cover having three passports. So you know, man, that's pretty you. Shylock. I'm not a dual yeah, citizen. Well, I'm a triple citizen. Yeah, but anyway. <laughs> yeah, so the law doesn't apply to me, so fuck you. And uh, he um, had a number of operations. I mean, you were mentioning Burisma, right? And and that uh, put uh, Hunter Biden in that no-show million-dollar-a-year job as a director. Uh, but there's also other stuff. Uh, he had Media One. And Media One uh, was the second or largest, perhaps, uh, TV producer in uh, Ukraine. And Ihor actually ran for president. And he got like 3% of the vote. I mean, nobody took him seriously. And so he decided to make his own candidate, which is what he did. He hired uh, uh, Vladimir Zelensky to be the actor uh, to play the lead in a show called Servant of the People. It's what and Bloomberg should have done. Yeah. Bloomberg yeah, couldn't exactly. get any votes. He should have hired an actor and be his puppet. <laughs> well, well, you know, Obama. <laughs> so, uh -huh. You know, but anyway, be Not that as Chicago, it may. So, yeah. Yeah, uh, be that as it may, um, Igor Kolomoisky um, paid and astroturfed the popularity of Servant of the People. And for people who have, who have watched the show, they say it was genuinely funny. It was an accidental president kind of show of this president who wanted to join, who was a, like a, a comedian who accidentally became president. And he, as president, wanted to join the European Union and, and you know, be more Western oriented. And uh, uh, Media One, uh, uh, Kolomoisky's um, production company, uh, did this show. And you know, after like three seasons or something, he transitioned um, the actor Zelensky playing the role of president in the show into being an actual candidate for president. And he won the presidency in 2017 or 18. And, uh, and he ran on a platform of unity and friends with Russia and peace and, and you know, 
And then, of course, the second he's president, he just flips it all around. Kolomoisky was also the guy who financed the Azov Battalion. Because the Azov Battalion originally were basically football hooligans from here in Kharkov, as a matter of fact. They were they backed the Medalist Football Club. And he organized uh, uh, from that initial core. Soccer of, in proper the, English. Yeah, uh, <laughs> association football. Yeah, soccer. But mm. Anyway, he, um, he organized these guys and uh, got them trained, NATO training. Okay, and they became razors. I mean, they became hardcore... Uh, um, soldiers and the Azov Battalion, famously, that went down to the last man at Mariupol. And so Kolomoisky had his fingers in a lot of different pies. And all of this, of course, was to stick it to the Russians, you know, because it, it, you got to keep in mind that, you see, many times these different factions have different ultimate goals, but they converge on the mechanisms to achieve those ultimate goals, okay? And you have to compare the history post-Soviet Union of Russia and Ukraine. See, both Russia and Ukraine in the 90s were being exploited by these oligarchs. But the difference was that Putin came into power in 99. And in the West, they were very happy because he thought, you know, he's one of our guys. He's going to allow the grift, He'll fight the, the exploitation yeah. of, of Russia, right? But what happened was that um, Putin... Uh, and, and the KGB coterie backing him didn't want these oligarchs having the influence that they had. And so they cut them off slowly but surely. It was a methodical process. And um, the difference between the standards of living in Russia and the standards of living in Ukraine is like night and day because uh, Putin and the people supporting Putin got rid of the oligarchs in Russia, whereas in Ukraine, these uh, oligarchs were just a cancer. I mean, just bloodsuckers who they divvied up the country. You have to understand each, it was sort of like each oligarch would have its own fiefdom. Kolomoisky was around Dnieperpetrovsk, right? But there were different oligarchs in different regions of the country controlling that area, okay? Very like much like Mexico? private fiefdoms. Yeah. And, all they, <laughs> yeah, and all they did was exploit it. Uh, I can't speak for Mexico because I'm not really up, up to speed on Mexico. Mm -hmm. Right now, it's far as our shells carving it up. Just... Yeah. But insofar as um, uh, uh, Ukraine is concerned, Ukraine's poverty, it shouldn't be a poor country because it has both natural and human resources that are, are off the charts. And very educated very, public very educated too. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it should have been one of the most prosperous, if not the most prosperous uh, nation of Europe. After all, it's got the population and it's got the natural resources, but it was relentlessly exploited by these blood-sucking oligarchs, uh, half of whom were of, uh, people who you shall not denamed, <clears throat> but uh, in Russia, Putin and the Kremlin um, basically neutered those oligarchs. And it's very easy to tell because if you look at the list of oligarchs back in 1999, and you look at the Russian oligarchs or very rich men today in, in Russia, the names have all changed. And also the current crop of quote unquote oligarchs, they're much more and most of them are simple, simply very, very successful businessmen. I mean, when we talk about an oligarch, what we're talking about a guy who's not merely rich, but who also has a lot going on in so far as political involvement, paramilitary groups, and a whole lot of corruption of paying off judges, paying off politicians. You know, the, the Plomo o Plata uh, scheme. The Plomo o Plata is a Spanish phrase that came from Pablo Escobar who would send um, a, a bullet wrapped in a hundred dollar bill to some politician. And it was basically the message is, okay, you can get money or you can get a bullet. Which do you want? Plomo, which is uh, lead, or plata, which is money. Well, it's literally silver, but you see the point. Yeah. And so what happened with, um, with, with uh, the, the oligarchy in Ukraine is that, the oligarchs rather in Ukraine, is that they're not merely businessmen, okay? Whereas the oligarchy that exists today in Russia is really just successful businessmen. Somebody like... Um, like Luke Lula. Um, like, no, th think of some oligarch like in the United States. Like, okay, like, let's take Elon Musk for the sake of argument, okay? Nobody says that Elon Musk has a power, paramilitary group that he is financing <laughs> with weapons and training, right? Uh, I'm sure he has political influence, but he doesn't have the kind of outright bribery or, or intimidation of politicians. 
that these oligarchs in Ukraine have and which existed in Russia until Putin and the group that supports Putin was KGB, certainly, but it's, it's much more important to understand what they actually were because they weren't merely intelligence people. It's, it's looking back retrospectively that these were Russian nationalists of, of a moderate variety. The people who are in charge of the Kremlin are extremely capable and they have a notion of it's weird. the Russian people. Because they are capable and, and I'm used to seeing politicians and I'm like scared every time they talk because it's embarrassing. And yeah. I was thinking about this. And I was talking to Andre about this too because he's written some great books on this. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking, where is our, like, James Baker from the 80s, right? We had some people mm -hmm. that were, knew what they Brent were doing. Brent Scowcroft. Where, yes, yeah, Scowcroft, smart, but evil, but smart. Um, yeah, I mean, whatever you might think of their morality, you can't say that they were stupid. They weren't dumb. And, yeah, I mean, even, like, I mean, Carter was smart. Kennedy was smart. Like, they're, they're people. Clinton's not dumb. He's not dumb. Oh, no. Like, he's a very intelligent man. And. Yeah. Then you get, you know, Bush Jr., Obama, Biden, Trump, and like, but you look at the cabinet, you think <laughs> Kamala Harris saying Russia's a big country, Ukraine's a smaller country. <laughs> or my favorite is viruses are very, very small. I'm like, well, at least she meant viruses are real. I mean, not at that level. But, <laughs> you know, like they're Stu Peters is saying the war in Ukraine is fake. <laughs> Well, no, it's a, the, the difference you see between the leadership class in the West and the leadership in the Kremlin is that the leaders in the Kremlin are actually running shit. Okay? Where's our Lavrov? I mean, you got a guy like Lavrov. Yeah, just, where's just the, to pick up that idea. in the U.S.? Nowhere, because Lavrov is the guy actually doing the shit. He's the guy with the brains, and he's oh, on, wait, on oh, top wait. of Oh, wait, I know who we have. I know who we have. That Jean-Pierre spokeswoman for the... Press secretary. Oh my God. That, that <laughs> woman. Oh my God. I did not no, think we could go nervous. lower than the ginger, Pisaki. And I heard this is funny. So in Russia, Pisaki so um was such a fucking airhead, you know, that they use her name as a verb to mean foobar. Like, oh, that got Pisaki. <laughs> Because it, so it sounds like, I don't know how you say that in Russian, but it's similar. And so they just, somebody decided, <laughs> uh, uh, Psaki. Like, it just means like, oh, I got all fucked up. <laughs> so her name became a verb. And I guess, uh, what is it, Jean-Pierre, Karine Jean-Pierre, whatever, his name is too long. But that woman is is just cringe, just, uh that's our press secretary. She's a lesbian woman of color. That's why she's right. There. Yeah, all the check boxes. But I'm sure even with all that, we still could have found a smarter lesbian woman of color. Like, well, now the problem is that they're putting uh, these unqualified people who are there just because of the virtue of their sexuality or race in positions that you really don't want them to be in, like uh, airline pilots. Tucker Carlson did a segment the other day. Oh, 50% some, uh, women coming around the corner. Yeah. You, you know, know, women I mean, aren't particularly um, interested in being pilots, so if you force that, you're going to end up with plane crashes. Well, my thinking is the following, okay? And I, 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 I think I'm going to get into a lot of trouble. Did you see the first female F-35 pilot? Oh, yeah. She, she totally... You know, she, she crashed the first the day plane. into yeah. an aircraft carrier. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Just perfect, you know? No, my thinking is the following, and I'll, I'll say it, and I know that people are going to clip it, and, and I'm going to get into trouble for it, but fuck it. Um... Uh, if the pilot ain't male and white, just change your flight. That's as simple as that, you know, because I'm not going to get on a plane with one of these diversity hires. Fuck no. Well, and if know? they're not male and white, you don't know whether they earned it because somebody could be something else and also yeah, be able to fly, it, it, but it, you'll it, always it, have that question mark. You're like, well, did you earn your job or are you just the best in your category? Yeah, exactly. And look, it could be a, a female lesbian woman of color, as they love to call them, uh, as opposed to just saying black. And if, if she's capable, fine, I, no problem. But you don't know. You don't know. That's the thing, you know. And so you're like, uh, no. And it's funny how people of color and colored person, which mean the same thing, but one sounds so much worse than the other. Oh, yeah, yeah. But have you noticed, you know, in Stanford, um, it, there's a big thing going on on Twitter about how Stanford now has only 22% white males in their incoming class. 
Stanford, right? And Stanford actually like eliminated the SATs as a, as a metric to get into it. Yeah. And I'm like, you know, the, the people who are going to graduate are going to be fucking morons. You know, well, it's just so Stan like before. getting a degree from Stanford is not going to mean anything anymore. Exactly. You know, I mean, you're and fucking so around with the missions based on identity politics. Stupid. Well, you're you're basically hollowing out the uh, structures of the United States by because of this uh, diversity shit. What's going on in South Africa today, you know, of uh, blackouts that are just all the time, you know, chaos, social chaos, where you have organized looters going around stealing everything that isn't bolted down. You know, that's the future of the United States, you know, and it's a tragedy. That's San Francisco right mean, now. They're Portland robbing too. trains. They're just going to Walgreens with backpacks and just steal stuff. Yeah. If it's not above yeah. a thousand, it's not above nine hundred and fifty bucks. Nothing will happen. They won't even go to jail. If they do, they get out by tomorrow. It's it's funny. I yeah. I I so I periodically go back to the U.S. Um, <clears throat> before I return to the first world um, here, and <laughs> I noticed at least in D.C. and stuff, I'll go in a store. I was like, oh, I'm gonna buy some deodorant. Or something else. I'll just get it when I'm over there. And it's all behind like a glass case, and you have to go ask and get a key to unlock it so you can go grab it. Right. In Japan, if I want to get deodorant, I just pick it up off the shelf, walk it up to the counter and buy it. Right. But in the yeah. US, so many people steal that they have to lock everything that can fit in your pocket behind a case, and you have to get an employee to go open it and stand there and watch you. And I'm weirded out. I'm like, I don't know which one I want or whatever just this one you know and i just it just felt weird like i gotta go hunt someone down and this is the best part so they have a store like cvs or walmart or whatever you, they have it all locked up so you gotta go find someone mm -hmm. i go find someone can you open this case i want to get an item and the the employee's like oh, like oh excuse me uh, for ruining your day you are at work right like this is your job <laughs> right and they're like oh what i was busy talking to somebody on something app or whatever I'm like are you wearing the CVS uniform and you have the keys go in there and unlock it or just leave it unlocked, leave a key in it, whatever. Like they act like I burden them by asking them to do what they're supposed to be doing anyway. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it's look, the, Amer uh, the United States is over. I did a video back in uh, late 2021, uh, you know, and I've been saying this <laughs> just for shooting down years, balloons but... with sidewinder missiles. Like twelve dollar balloons with sidewinder missiles. Yeah. It's just like balloon hobbyists, and they went on and they called them UFOs, and they like shoot down that Chinese spy balloon. I'm like, you know, they have satellites, right? You know this, right? They don't need a balloon, but they just went. Oh, no, of course cool. not. And, and they finally admitted, oh yeah, it was just a Chinese balloon, weather balloon that got blown off course. They it really was. Admitted. Yeah. That's Why would China that. make a slow moving, high altitude weather balloon and go and? which doubled as a spy satellite, which everyone's going to see. It goes like a mile an hour or whatever. <laughs> like, and then try to spy the United States. Uh, when they're stupid. already, they got <laughs> Miss Fang Fang sleeping with Swalwell and, you know, they're already literally embedded, bedded yeah, with know. our uh, politicians. They don't need a spy satellite. The Biden yeah, family right. would sell them everything. You, but <laughs> I'm really pissed off about the fact that uh, the Chinese or the Russians don't send me some, you know, hot young thing to get info out of me. You know, it's always bastards like Swalwell or, or Biden that they send the little hot young thing. You know, no, no, nothing to us poor bastards who are, you know, just pointing shit out. Because ultimately, we, you and I, are get into trouble for pointing shit out. That's it. I've had honey you traps know, the, sent to me, but I'm oh, like. Really? Yeah, like almost every time I go to the U.S., I get a couple, and I'm and I'm like, you're not even Asian, like you didn't do your homework. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, no, <laughs> I, I totally point out, it's like it's real, it's really easy to spot because this is a stat to blow your mind. Maybe not you, you know this shit, but it's like the average weight of American females is 170 pounds, and for black women is 187. The average weight of Japanese girls is 116, which is like model weight <coughs> in the United States, or like. Oh yeah, it just doesn't happen. But here, that's just normal. I see it very attractive people every day, and so like you send, I'm like, I'm a little bit peeved. I'm like, that's it. That's the bet. You didn't put a lot of effort in. She's not even cute, you know. No, like, I'm like, yeah. I, I, I mean, I'm not going to take the bait regardless. But I mean, come on, step it up a notch, guys. Like, 
I really don't think yeah, they I have enough. Been, <laughs> yeah, I've been honey, honey trapped twice. Uh, back in 2010, I was writing a financial blog uh, because I was managing some money at the time. And uh, this was, uh, I, I started writing this blog starting around the, the global financial crisis just to organize my thoughts. And the thing took off and people really liked it and I had a lot of views and so forth. And there was this guy, um, his name slips my mind right now, but, um, but I have the, the records of the receipts. And this guy, um, you know, said he was a big fan and, and all the rest of it. And we swapped emails back and forth kind of thing. But, you know, I was looking at my emails on, on my browser window, Gmail account, right? On my browser mm -hmm. window. And you, you, I, I had the list of all the previous conversations, right? And, and it had the same name. But it was weird because one of the, the emails that I got from him was in a different color. Like, like say all the emails from him had been like in, in dark purple. But there was one that was like in dark green. And at first, I, I really looked into the, the, the screen thinking to myself, well, I, I, you know, am I seeing this properly? And why is it a different color? So I went to check the email. The guy had, had had obviously multiple emails on his thing, and he had used the wrong email to reply to one of my, uh, to one of my missives. And he was from the Department of Homeland Security. You know, and, I, and he, he was like, you know, cultivating me. And I was just saying just financial shit, you know. But DHS, you know, dot gov. And then I looked him up and he was on LinkedIn. It was really fucking funny. He was like some cyber security guy at the DHS. And that happened to me back in 2010, 2011, I want to say. And then in 2018, when I was running the Coach Red Pill channel, my audience was 97% uh, male. Okay. And, and the women who would watch my videos were usually either older women who completely agreed or younger women who thought I was a troglodyte and would just hate watching me, right? But all of a sudden I get these emails from this cute little thing. Um, and I actually did a video call with her, which I recorded by the way. And um, she was this cute little thing. Uh, at least I never saw her, her image. I only got her voice, but she sounded very young. And she was like all flirty and shit. And I'm like, this doesn't make any fucking sense. This mm -hmm. makes no sense whatsoever that you know my channel which is you know aimed at guys 97 percent audience is guys and this hot young thing is like flirting on me online oh come on man come on make an effort at least you know and so yeah they they um they consistently try to uh um honeypot you and and especially if you're visible okay but um yeah, yeah I, what, I, I what's bad is anytime there is just a regular girl and there are sometimes all the guys around me are like, watch out. That's a honey trap. <laughs> they're all like, oh, She's yeah. just a regular person, but they're like, that's a honey trap. It's a honey trap. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because you never, because it's that it's rare, a good looking girl is into politics. It. What, what are you a unicorn? Like it doesn't make any sense, but they, they occasionally, no, no, there are trap. such women. Okay. Sure. Uh, you know, hot young things who are really interested in what's going on in the world. Sure. There, there there's everything in the world. Right. But the thing is, you know, you never know. So you err on the side of caution. You know, it's, it's really fucking funny. No, what I, I'm noticing is the incredible demoralization of young men in the West. They're just like throwing in the towel. Oh, this is a disaster for any I'm recently moved over. I have a, because I was banned on everything. I joined Cozy TV. I'm like, this, it was fine yeah. in the beginning. But then, my God, all they want to talk about is race realism every day. And I'm like, Jesus, dude, like uh -huh. I'm on the other topics. And there's just some legit trash. So I, a friend of a friend of mine decided to honey trap a bunch of them because they're always trashing women and stuff. It was so easy. Like they are the biggest yeah. simps. And then I put it all on yeah. a compilation video <laughs> and showed it the world. <laughs> yeah. You, you post that on Twitter. I'll, I'll, I'll um, I'm going to start posting them one at a time on Twitter, yeah. like drag it out. That's almost like worth shekel chats. You want to see another one? It's some weird stuff. They all did the love bomb technique. They did the, uh, it was, they were so pathetic, man. Like lick your toes level fucking simps. And I knew, I knew they were going to be like that. I knew they were going to be like, like, none of these people have ever been to the gym, ever done anything. And they're just, oh, they're so fucking fake. And I was like, you guys, this is why you're relentlessly turning me <laughs> online and trolling people and acting tough and stuff because you are so lonely. And I tried to have sympathy for them, but then I see how they behave. I'm like, no, man, it's your fault. Like, you can blame the girls, and the girls are trash too, but 
you guys aren't worth having. Like you're just, you know, all you do is game all day and masturbate. Like you don't, you don't have anything to offer a woman. And a lot of the women, I guess, and they're like, well, I don't care. Everybody's fat and and what the few that aren't are just on tender looking for millionaires or whatever. It's like, if you're a woman in the US that's not overweight and you know how to use filters and stuff, you could slide right into a celebrity's DM, no problem, because they're slim pickings over there. Yeah. Everybody's yeah. ugly. No, I mean, it's it's really like, oh, I got a new report on Twitter. Yeah, you know, they, they want to ban me for something I said. Yeah, it, it, sorry about that. I was just um, checking my... Um, oh, you got one? Yeah. <laughs> no, I got, I got a message here, you know, notification. I was, because I have notifications for very few things. I mean, Mm -hmm. and and so sorry about that but like no it's i posted on twitter recently i mean in the last 24 hours uh, a video i came across of these two girls right they were talking to some interviewer on the street kind of thing you know and and the guy was asking what's what's like the worst thing that you've done and these girls looked wholesome they looked like what you and i would consider like a nice girl 20 30 years ago and one was saying that, oh, you know, I cheated on my boyfriend with uh, a guy that I told him that he shouldn't worry about. And the other girl said that she had performed fellatio on a guy uh, 20 minutes after blowing his best friend. And I'm like, and they were like talking about it and laughing like it's a funny thing. No shame. I mean, the fact that they would they would admit to this. And public, announce that to the Internet, right? Yeah. yeah, and I thought to myself, you know, if I'm the parent of one of these girls, I'd be horrified. I, I'd be just like, what the hell? And also, it's it, something that people don't seem to realize. It is extremely demoralizing to the parents of these whores and these simps to see how pathetic their children have become. Because think of it, you know, I, I'm a parent, right? Me too. Altogether, yeah. I have four children. And, uh, okay, so you know, you make a lot of sacrifices, uh, you know, you, you eschew a lot of things that you'd like to do, but you, that you can't because you have responsibilities to your children, to provide for them, to not go out partying on a Friday and a Saturday because, you know, the kid's up with the, you know, with the flu or whatever. You know, you, you do, you make a lot of sacrifices and you figure that it'll be worth it because they'll grow into decent adults that you can depend on and respect. But to, if you're a parent and you see your child bragging about giving fellatio to two different guys in a 20 minute span, how demoralizing do you think that is to, to realize that all your sacrifices were for nothing? You, you basically raised a whore. Good God, I would be seriously depressed to tell you the truth. There's so many, this kind of club culture trading up thing. When you commoditize sex, that's why there's a casting couch because Ooh. they've made it a almost like a business transaction yeah mm -hmm. there's another video that i also posted on twitter there was this um attendant at like a like a target store and some guy he was filming and uh it, for some reason he asked her something and um and you know, she gave him a reply oh we're going to aisle whatever and he went but then he kind of like cut the video because he returned to the woman and he said look i couldn't help thinking that you remind me of somebody and he dialed up some porn site you know okay and and he said is this you and, and she giggled and like oh yeah you know i work here part-time but yeah that's that's my main job basically being a prostitute and they interacted just a little bit more and he asked you know when are you free and she said oh well you know you know maybe in about five minutes i can meet you in your car you know to Ugh. do whatever you know and and, and she was like you know smiling like it's all good she was this um you know fairly dumping looking uh black woman uh black girl i mean she looked like maybe 20 22 at most and you think to yourself you know that, that how, how how pathetic how, how just absolutely pathetic because this certainly doesn't happen in eastern europe okay i mean sure you know i read there's the 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 the, the meme or the, the stereotype that all Russian and Ukrainian women are prostitutes. Yeah, because a lot of the prostitutes from Russia and Ukraine, who are a, a very tiny minority in, in these countries, you know, went to the West to seek bigger fortunes, you know, make more money. Okay. And so that's why you have the stereotype. Of the it's West. more money, less but, competition. Yeah, exactly. But the vast majority of women, I can say this unequivocally, the vast majority in, in Ukraine of the women here, 
you know, they, they are very feminine. They, they make an effort to look good. Even middle-aged women, even women that you would consider, you know, close to elderly, they make the effort to look good. And they're certainly not involved in, in any kind of prostitution. On the contrary, they're very, you know, wholesome and decent people. And so, but that wholesomeness, that decency is just vanished in the West. It's just, it's just so sad. They, they don't seem to realize what they're doing to their souls, you know, because that shit lingers in, in a person's soul, in their psyche. Call it what you will. You know what I mean? God. It's status seeking. Like it breaks my, it breaks my heart, man. Guys used to seek status by like having good looking women around them or whatever. But since you can pay for that, that doesn't mean anything. And girls just want to have backgrounds. Look at me on this yacht. Look at me in this Ooh. restaurant. Look at me in this thing. Yeah. I mean, Look at I, Dan I was, Bilzerian. I was picked. I to admit, you know, Dan Bilzerian is the guy I despise the most. Who? Oh, that guy. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah, how can you be yeah. like look at the escort i bought i mean so okay you paid money yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly <laughs> you know i mean it, it, it's it, it's oh my god I, I and he's admired and he has money because his father was a thief that's why he has money and well, uh and he brags about the money his father stole by hiring prostitutes and renting exotic sports cars yeah. like, how pathetic you rented know, a car and, and bought some hose. It's like the president's son. I mean, Hunter Biden got money because of his dad. Oh, that's a sweet also, gig. A, that's a sweet gig. He's also that, a thief. I, and uh, yeah. yeah, he just rents, buys, buys hookers and does drugs and sells influence because he's got access to first the senator, then All the three. vice president, then the president. Yeah. You know, I mean, Jesus Christ, that, that is just. No, and also th that that whole Biden family, you know, the 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 revelations of the of the um, of the diary of Ashley Biden's diary where she well, look, Joe Biden is such a Joe Biden. He, he conserves for the environment so much he showers with his daughter. Um, Th that is creepy. Shit. I have a Biden I mean, map that too. Is seriously, creepy dude. Shit. It, he's weird. Like, I got hairy legs. So I learned a lot about roaches. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? He's weird. No, you know, I have to say, you know, the, the, the shower thing really struck me because I have a nine-year-old daughter. And she was okay? having and sex at that point. Dream. She was older than nine. Yeah. yeah. I would it's... never dream of doing such a thing, you know, because I actually have uh, taken a shower with my kid, but it's really kind of like a grim story because it was when uh, my son was like uh, four months old, three months old, and he had one of these explosive you know, diaper just went kaflooey kind of thing, right? And I'm like, oh my God, what the hell do I do with this kid? It was the morning, so I just whipped off my pajamas, you know, snatched him up and just took a quick shower to wash him off because he was grim. But that was like the, the, the only time I would ever conceive of doing something. It was more like a practical cleaning up the poor kid. He was like, he thought it was so cool to be like in, in the shower, you know, it's three months old, four months old. And so, you know, but like a, a child of nine or 11 or whatever the hell, actually, that's sexual. That's what, what I'm pointing is. out is in the diary, the few sentences before she talks about showering with her dad, she's talking about she's had sex with her friends. Right? So she's already old enough to be having sex with her friends and then talks about showering with her dad. Probably inappropriate, like a sarcasm. Like, of course it is. And just no, and there, there's man, all kinds of uh, Hunter or, or kind of like married Hunter, his brother's he, widow. No, he's yeah. Well, <laughs> apart from that, he and then cheated on her with a hooker who she got pre he got pregnant. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's just and, deliverance and, over there. No, and that and should have been all he, over the news if one of the Trump children had married oh, yeah. the other one's widow and then got a hooker pregnant. Like, oh, you would never hear the end of it. No, yeah, exactly. It's and, just la da. You know, um, I have to admit, there's something I'm kind of impressed by is how the Trump kids, whatever you might think of them, they're relatively normal, you know? I mean, how the hell, I mean, they seem to be hardworking people, you know? I mean, who knows what they're doing behind closed doors? I mean, who knows what anybody's is, doing? Is Baron going to rule us all? But, but yeah, <laughs> giant like, baron. Holy shit! What the fuck happened to that kid? He's I don't he's know. Growth hormones or something. That guy's man. a big unit. You know, Trump I mean, is big. I mean, know, Randy, his third. What is his third, fourth wife? Whatever. 
Melania's yeah. like almost six feet tall, and Trump was like six, three or four. So, but they yeah, yeah, Aaron. Yeah. It's a, yeah, no, but the kid, I mean, Randy Johnson calls him the big unit. I mean, holy shit. You know what I'm He's I mean? still not even done but, growing. Like, no, no, he's, he's huge, man. I, and you know, Trump's but, uh, a big fan. He's a big fan of WWE. So I wonder if one day we'll see Baron Trump. <laughs> like, like, hit the music. And it's him. <laughs> oh, it's, the only thing no, that's like, going to be like, left. You talk about the collapse yeah, so, of America. Do you, I'm sure you've mm -hmm. seen the movie Idiocracy. Oh, it's yeah. Like, that was prescient. That was fucking like. It was there's a, a debate on what genre. Future. It's supposed to be comedy, but. You know, some it's people not. take it as it's a horror not. film. Some people take it no. as a documentary. Yeah, a I see it as a, of the future. a prophecy. Uh, yeah. But anyway, have you seen the show where people just stand there with their arms behind their back and somebody slaps them? Just they just have to get slapped. Oh, yeah. in it. That's like dumb. Okay, so in Idiocracy, there's a TV show called "Ouch My Balls." Where basically just a guy gets hit in the ball. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, we're there. We're there. Like uh, the slap in the face game is that close to ouch my balls with yeah. Mountain Dew, yeah. whatever his damn name I'd is. I've forgotten that. Yeah, with Mountain Dew. Like, like uh, you know how people compare um, The Simpsons? Like The Simpsons made, like, oh, this happened in The Simpsons. And then it's like Trump on the escalator, the famous one. I'm like, you could go through idiocracy, like some of the stuff they do at the food processing plants. I'm like, that happened. And then slap in the face is ouch my balls. Like it's going through, and I can totally see this where they turn to this midwit, like he's some super genius. Like, what did we do? Have you tried water? Like, that close, man. Because <laughs> you look at the press secretary and the vice president, and you're thinking you couldn't find anybody more vapid. Remember when they made fun of Dan Quayle because yeah. he was spilled potato? I'd take him in a second. Then it was like Sarah well, the, Palin. The they went part, the, the thing that, that bothers me is that you know I'm a grammar Nazi, right? And potato with an e. In, in, you heard it. The is it, Nazi. It's acceptable. You know, yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, it, it's well, potatoes in, has in, an e. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. 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 Potato uh, as a singular ending in o e. In some, it, it, it's it's like color uh, spelled c o l o r or c o l o u r. Mm -hmm. uh, in, in in the case of the word color, the one with the u is predominantly British. But it, it, the potato. Yeah, Daniel Webster the took the U out of color, and potato and tomato both used to have E's. Those are Native American words, but people yeah. can't say oh, it. so they just made it O, oh. so they drop the E. Yeah, it's like, yeah, it's like ketchup. Ketchup. That's not how you spell ketchup. As K E T C U C H U P. It's catsup. C A T S U P. But, you know, with usage and, and misspelling, people have turned it with a K and C-H-U-P. But, you know, uh, you know. Yeah, and, and that was the Dan Quayle thing. Yeah, totally off. Uh, it, I don't but care if he misspelled potato. It's not like Dan Quayle is not on the level of the stuff we have today. <laughs> like He no, would be no. hands down the smartest guy in the room compared to the yeah. people we got now. Well, the thing is that Dan Quayle wasn't actually stupid. He was a smart man that came across stupid on camera. The camera I met can him. do tricky things to you. I met oh, him at Boar's Head Inn in Charlottesville. He had, and and what like, do you think of it? He had like five sons or something. He had a big family. Yeah, a perfectly yeah, normal, yeah. very polite, you know, Mr. Vice President stuff. They, they, I want to say he ordered potatoes, but I didn't. I was like, <laughs> it's no. like, you know, when he was president pro tem after George Bush Sr. fainted in the soup in Japan, the stock market was soaring. Because he was kind of scared to do anything because Bush was coming back and he didn't know what the deals were going to be or not going to be. So he did nothing, which is what the government ought to do. And mm. everything took off. So he was like a good president <laughs> for a week or whatever it was. Like He wasn't so bad. And they just grilled no, him. I mean, look, at, look at George um, George Bush Sr. and his administration compared to the current one. You had Jim Baker as Secretary of State. Brent mm. Scowcroft as National Security Advisor. You had Dan Quayle, who, uh, you know, come on, he's like at least two standard deviations above the norm IQ wise right. compared to Kamala Harris, who's a bona fide idiot. I mean, that woman does not have 85 IQ points or more. No, it's below 85. Um, and she's stoned all the time. That's something that nobody yeah. mentions, by the way. You know, she's high. That's why she's on, always cackling. On, on pot. Yeah, she's high on pot all the time. Holy shit. You know, we're going to have a, a, a pothead president with Kamala Harris because she is going to be president. 
They're, they're going to maneuver Joe Bush, uh, uh, Joe Biden. Out of <laughs> Was that on purpose? <laughs> oh, no. No, yeah. <laughs> no I, I mean, mean you it, like the Reagan had men. He had some, the, you know, and then Kennedy had the whiz kids and Reagan had his well, little even brain. George uh, George Bush Jr., right? He might have been an idiot, but he had very sharp customers around him, however malevolent they might have been. Yeah, but Richard Pearl too. was not dumb, but he's evil as hell. Dick um, Cheney, same thing. He's evil motherfucker, but he knew what he was yeah, doing. Yeah, Dick Cheney was sharp. No. Uh, Doug Fife was a Muppet idiot. Uh, there well, was, there was some was a guy who wrote, you, you, Do you read the uh, uh, Clean Break memo? <laughs> yes, Douglas so Fife was the guy who, What? Of course I do. <laughs> yeah, you know, okay. it's just funny. Like you don't know. Like I, yeah, I am. Yeah, I know the clean break. Yeah, you're you're on top of that issue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the fact that the that basically for those of you who might not know, in 1996, uh, Doug Fife and, a, and another little coterie of neocons per, per, uh, wrote this essay for Israel, basically saying that Israel should no longer negotiate with its uh, Middle Eastern neighbors, but rather should just go about regime change in all of them in a very systematic way. And Netanyahu said, no, we can't really push this here in Israel, but maybe in America. And that's where the whole project for the new American century came up to push. That Pat memo. Buchanan read that clean break strategy and said the road to Damascus leads through Baghdad. And that's the two consecutive wars they did. Judith yep. Miller even lied and said, oh, maybe they moved the WMDs to Syria and the people she sourced, Paul Wolfowitz, Richard Pearl, and Israeli security forces. Of course, it ends up in the New York Times, of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, that was so, the precursor yeah. to PNAC. Was, and they also wrote the Afghan Vortex, which is laid out that whole exactly what we did. It was a script. Before Clean Break was Oded Yadon's uh, paper on Israeli security. And it finally got translated into English. And it lays out what they wanted. To, they wanted to divide Iraq, get Kurds, Shia, and Sunni fighting with each other in different factions. They explained it all. But what's funny is you mentioned Dick Cheney in 1994. Bush is interviewing him about why they didn't finish off Saddam or whatever. And he elegantly says, because it would have created a quagmire and you'd have pieces of Iraq fly off. It would threaten the territorial integrity of Turkey with the Kurds being in northern Iraq. Exactly what happened after 2003. So he definitely knew better, but went along yeah. with it anyway, because he was so tied to Kellogg Brown and Root and Halliburton and so on. But like yeah. he was one of, he knew, they all knew. They all knew. But, they all knew. you know, Israel ended up getting 77% of its oil imports from Iraq after the war. U.S. lost $6 trillion. That's what they got out of it. And, yeah. yep. and they're going to lose yeah. in Ukraine. Yep. So that let's let's go in the future. We went in the past, how it started, sure. Maidan coup, et cetera. They're getting tanks, maybe, the spring, whatever they say. They're going to mean nothing. They mean nothing. They're too few. It's not an issue of the quality of the tanks themselves or the crews manning them. They're just simply too few. Okay, so they're not going to make a lick of a difference. And, and I can point to the obvious fact that uh, before the conflict started, the Ukrainians had something like 2,000 uh, tanks and armored vehicles. And the fact that they're begging for these vehicles now, well, what happened to those 2,000? <laughs> they're fucking gone. That's what happened to them. And the Russians blew them up. And uh, insofar as these tanks, we're, we're talking, you know, famously, the Germans are going to send 88 in total, but 14 now. No, I, you can't leopards. make this shit up. <laughs> yeah, true. leopards. Yeah, I, I was like, so leopard two four eight. Again, he was absolutely right. It's not like the leopards suck, but if you use just one or two at a time with a bunch of Bradleys in Bradley's waist, there's not a tank in the world that's going to be successful like that. Shit up. The Germans are going to send 14 out of 88 now. And, you know, like, didn't somebody in the PR department catch up on that? Um, German that tanks are rolling thing. through Poland to go into Ukraine to yeah. fight the Russians. Yeah, exactly. Again. And well, <laughs> again, you know, if you add up all the leopards and all the Bradleys and whatever, what if uh, and, what uh, if the leopards arrive on enough. April 20th? <laughs> Then you know look, someone either we're living in a simulation or someone's messing with us. Like, <laughs> yeah, somebody, yeah, it's yeah, one or the other. Yeah, I think that's people are messing with us. But anyway, the oh shit, like a fucking air raid. Sorry, air let raid. me close my window real quick. Um, sorry about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I get them periodically, and it's very annoying. Um, let me just close this window here, so it just you know. 
hang on a second. Sorry. I said I'm in my terrace, uh, which is where I allow myself to smoke because I don't like smoking inside my apartment. Um, we get those too, but, uh, but only like mm -hmm. twice a year. What? The air raid sirens. <laughs> When North Korea oh, when shoots Japan? a missile, yeah. When North Korea shoots missiles over the island or whatever, yeah. Just well, the, that Korean started just smart. this year. Just this year, they got them. They'd always shoot them in the Sea of Japan. Now they're they're. Oh, proven. actually, while I'm at it, I'm gonna I'm gonna get more coffee. Uh, yeah, go for it. But yeah, the, the North Koreans were smart uh, of getting nukes and ballistic missiles because now nobody's gonna fuck with them. Uh, well, Bolden uh, spilled Iran the beans, about. didn't he? He was like, uh, "We're gonna give you the Libya treatment." He's like, well, there's no way I'm getting yeah. rid of the nukes because what happened to Gaddafi when he got rid of his? Yeah, exactly. You killed yeah, him. You exactly. killed his children. I mean, yeah. yeah. John, and so, Bolton. John yeah, Bolton is so fucking stupid, too. Like, it's like, I don't know, man, that mustache migrated off McCain's ass and onto <laughs> his face or something. <laughs> like, he's calling the mustache. Well, no, it, it's, it's, <clears throat> it's the problem of people who think that they're smart but actually aren't. The victims of Dunning Kruger. You know, yeah. I mean, one of the most important things you, you and I were, were talking before the show started of like, um, you know, uh, of these people who insist on knowing everything. And like, there's lots of shit that you don't know. And you mm -hmm. should be humble insofar as your ignorance. You mentioned Mexico, for instance, in the situation. And you just said, I don't know there. about that. I'm like, OK, we'll move along. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, uh, there's no sin in saying, oh, I don't know something. It's, it's inconceivable for any human being to know everything about everything. That, that's just ridiculous. And and so the hubris of these people, Except this guy. they're unwilling. Yeah. Yeah. Who's this guy? Oh, uh, Uncle Unibomber? Ted. No. <laughs> well, I, I did, I no, he his, didn't know everything about everything. He just loved his manifesto. Oh, just well, I, I read it. It's, it. it's philosophically incoherent. OK, his critique of the left is really spot on. But philosophically, I mean, I, I did a whole broadcast on that for my Patreon a while back. So I forgot the details. His but psychology of modern is, leftism is spot on, and his idea yeah, that, that that's his idea that we had a physical and psychological evolution, like two simultaneous evolutions of our psyche and our our physical body, right? And that we've just, in his mind, a lot of the depression and all these things have been caused from that changing faster than we can adapt to it, which he blames yeah, on industrial society. I mean. It, yeah, he, 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 he's, he's correct on, on, on diagnosing certain problems, but the underlying, so I forgot the details of the argument. I have to look at my notes to refresh, and, and so it would take me a while to do it. Yeah, we don't have to argue fine. about it. I mean, we just get it later. Yeah. <laughs> but, but no, I, I, I mean, I, I, I despise Ted Kaczynski um, for... Um, Being a serial for, killer, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, you <laughs> yeah. know, I mean, that's what he was. And, and he was doing it in such a cowardly way, you know? Um, you, you know, uh, of just sending anonymous bombs to random people who had no reason to suspect that they would be targeted for any kind of violence. I really find that despicable. Okay. And so Ted Kaczynski, I, I, I read him and I say, yes, he's right about a lot of things. Uh, is he somebody that I admire, quote unquote? No, I, I, on the contrary, I find him despicable as a human being. Okay. Well, uh, if, if he was so confident we think there is more bomb, than one person sending bombs. And he took well, the be that as it may, you know, I'm, I'm not going to get into the weeds of that particular discussion. But insofar as Kaczynski himself, um, no, I'm, I'm, I, I, no, he's not somebody I admire under any stretch of the imagination. Although, because of the notoriety of his serial murders, uh, you know, it was inevitable that what he had written would get a lot of attention. I mean, it was plastered all over the New York Times and the Washington Post uh, back in the day, right? And so, yeah, you can you can um, read it and and agree with a lot of his criticisms, you know, but not be on board with his whole program or certainly the actions that he committed. Oh yeah, I mean, I that's, mean, that's with a lot of people. There are a lot of people like Socrates probably was a pederast, but that doesn't oh, yeah, negate definitely. everything he said. Too. But yeah, exactly. well, Aristotle's philosophy is pretty solid, especially for the time, and you don't have to agree with all of it. Whatever, I think his son's book on ethics was underrated too. But yeah, there's this, there's this yeah. thing. That's right, where they someone's got to be like as pure as Ron Paul, or you throw them out, right? And there just aren't oh, yeah. any Ron Pauls, right? Somebody, everybody's yeah. got a vice. Jefferson, love yeah. him. He had slaves. Okay, that wasn't yeah, that no, unusual he, at the time. And he, uh, and he had. Uh, 
he had children with one of his slaves who that were destined is, to become no, slaves himself. No, that was Randolph Jefferson. That was not Thomas Jefferson. You got a book on well, that. Well, be that as it may. Yeah. I, like, again, I, it, it doesn't matter. You, 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 can, you can appreciate Sally Hemings was not wrote. Jefferson's uh, mistress. But they, I, mean, I don't just, care enough to yeah. have. Uh, uh, I, I, I do, so I'm going to say it. Okay, okay <laughs> yeah. fair enough. But, but whoever, as far as I mean, the conflict of Ukraine, let, let's bring bring the conversation back to the Ukraine yes. situation. There isn't going to be any negotiated ceasefire. The Russians are going to take over the whole fucking country, and I mean that's as simple as that. Because the Russians don't the whole believe thing. anything that the West says. Oh yeah, they're going to take over. The so whole they're country. not going to stop at the Dnieper River, just plus Odessa. No, they're just going to keep on rolling all the way to the Polish border. No question. Man, I mean, let me rephrase it. I'd be extraordinarily surprised if they um if, if they negotiate a ceasefire because the russians don't believe in the west anymore because the western the west has admitted that the minsk two agreements which were signed in 2015 and approved by the u.n security council that's right as a as the roadmap to lasting peace in the region just biden time you know they've all admitted uh francois Hollande, uh, angela merkel um poroshenko they've all admitted that it was just a way to buy time to arm um the kiev regime so the Russians are like, fuck you. We're not going to agree to any, any, any compromise. I mean, they'll say that, sure, we're always open to negotiation. You know, it's the polite thing to do. But, you know, the, the, the Zelensky regime is putting out outlandish pro proposals as the starting point for negotiations. They're saying that um, Ukraine will only start negotiations once all of the Russian troops are out of Ukraine territory, and uh, <laughs> including Crimea, and that Crimea is turned into a demilitarized yeah. zone. Fuck right. off. Fuck off. That's never going to happen. Oh, and the other thing, too, is that by law, they have passed a law in Ukraine where the, the Ukraine cannot negotiate with if Vladimir Putin is the president of the Kremlin, uh, president of Russia, rather. Uh, and, and also it lists some other figures in the Kremlin who are in power today, who they also would refuse to negotiate with. So, you know, it's basically, uh, you know, they're poisoning the well and claiming that they're open to negotiations when they're not. And so the Russians are just going to play along and they're just going to grind away and they're going to take over the whole fucking country. Because what will happen is the inevitable, which is at some point the Kiev regime forces are going to collapse. Yeah. You cannot continue this rate of loss of up to a thousand men a day and, and think that you're going to survive this. OK, and that's the rate that they're going at between killed in action and wounded incapacitated it's it's just you know inevitable that the kiev regime forces are going to collapse and once that collapse happens see my thinking is that this army that has surrounded ukraine because altogether there are about seven hundred thousand troops surrounding ukraine and there are some uh, 150 odd more thousand on the way. yeah yeah and, and more on the way in belarus here in ukraine in Bulgaria, just across here i'm 40 kilometers from the border with russia and the region uh, across from Kharkov is called Bolgorod. And there they have another grouping of 150, 200,000 men. They have another, and they're loaded with gear. I mean, tanks, helicopters, this, that, the other, everything. And plus the forces that they have in the south. Um, yeah, eventually that army is an occupying force. That's the point of it. That's the reason they have assembled this force. Mm. It's not a force to fight. It's a force to occupy. And sure, there's going to be some fighting along the way. Because Western Ukraine would be an insurgency, it seems like they could hold the East. Not, not so much. You don't no, think so? I think that no. I think that see the insurgents that appeared in the Middle East. A lot of that insurgency had to do with clan affiliation, and tribal affiliation, but you don't have that kind of social cohesion among the uh, more radical people of the of the Kiev regime. They're ideological, but not familial. They don't have these long, deep ties of loyalty to one another. And so when shit gets heavy and the Russians are really showing up in force in Western Ukraine, those guys are going to flee to Europe. They're going to flee to Poland. No way are they going to stand and fight because they're just not up to the task, especially if the Kiev regime, if the army, the armed force of Ukraine has been completely destroyed by the Russians, which is what they are in the process of doing right now in this war of attrition. You're not going to have insurgency. And on top of that, the Russians are extremely good at handling insurgency witness what they did in Chechnya. They had two wars in Chechnya. And now Chechnya, Chechnya is, you know, I, I don't want to belittle the Chechens in any way, but they are as friendly as can be with the Russians at this point, you know? And, and, and you know, Kadyrov, the leader of Chechnya, 
is out there in the front, you know, saying Russia, Russia, yay, yay, you know. I mean, so didn't he drive a bus them. for the Mary Apple surrendered soldiers? <laughs> Do you remember? Didn't that? he drive what? I'm sorry. Like they had the they're putting the, he didn't really, but they're putting these um as off people and they they'd been held up in Mary Apple. They hadn't eaten. They were getting smaller. They put them on buses. And the joke was like you're on a bus to Siberia now. But they took, they're checking for tattoos and stuff. And like, all right, you're on the bus, you're on the bus. And then somebody cut to the Chechen leader driving a bus, like he's guys, my bus full of Nazis. It's just, like... <laughs> it's, it's his style. I mean, you gotta, you, whatever you might think of him, the guy knows how to troll. You know, he's funny. He's a funny guy. He's up yeah. there. President Trump's my, the best trolling world leader, though, with, uh, when he put Bill Clinton's rape accusers in the front row, so oh, Hillary had to look at him. Oh, oh God! That how can you not? Priceless. That's you know a little bit like uh, you know I want to hate you, but man, damn, that was good. <laughs> that, that was just funny, you know. Yeah, Call, Trump, called Elizabeth you know, Warren Pocahontas, and he called Kim Jong Un the little rocket man. I'm like, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is a, a president of the United States, and this is how he acts. But he just act like he's cutting a wrestling promo the whole time. Well, the he thing is, he, people. he has this knack <laughs> for coming up with the perfect name for his opponents that completely belittles them, that belittles them in a way that they can't recover from. Like lying <laughs> Ted about Ted Cruz. You know, Ted Cruz is never going to be able to get out from under that. You yeah. know, I, I, it, it, Sleepy it's Joe. Just, he's just, yeah. yeah, Sleepy Joe, you know. Crooked uh, Hillary. It's just, yeah, you, you. You know, yeah, it's like WrestleMania. It's goddamn funny, if you ask me. He's buddies with Vince McMahon. I mean, he financed WrestleMania four and five. That was Trump had that at Atlantic City. For another way. Yeah, Sitting in the yeah, front row with Bob Labuti from the Mafia. <laughs> well, but that was a fundamental problem with with uh, with Trump. He was a great entertainer, and he was very good at um, playing to his audience and identifying the things that his audience really liked and responded to, and amplifying that. Yeah. And so that's why he was able to latch on to the legitimate grievances of so much of the American people and ride that wave to the presidency. But unfortunately, he was not a person who actually believed in any of the shit that he was saying because he's just a used car salesman. And he couldn't assemble a team of people who would actually implement these policy measures yeah, that would the worst have people around swashed him. Yeah, he, he hired literally the worst people, the people who actually but wanted him When to he was a lame duck president Martin. and he brought in Doug McGregor and he and he fired Bolton, he got rid of Albright, all, all these like snakes. Mm -hmm. He only had like a month left. But if he had had that team that he had like that December, January, whatever, the whole time, everything would have been different. But he just kept listening to people like Sheldon Adelson, right? And John Bolton. Why did you bring John Bolton to Hanoi? What do you think was going to happen? You knew he's going to sabotage everything. You yeah. bring him in there anyway. And yeah. Just, yeah. He's the worst people just, around him. Yeah, I think it, a lot of people just, were voting against Hillary. Like, oh, yeah. Of it, course. She's just certifiably fucking. Ugh. No, and, and there are a lot of people who said, okay, I'm going to vote for Trump. He's not going to win, but fuck Hillary. You know, I mean, that's what happened. It was kind of F you to the whole system. Like, we're going to vote for Trump. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Because I'm just, I don't care. I want to see what happens. It's, it's so bad. Nothing ever changes. They're sick of the establishment. Let's get this clown, whatever. It reminds me of that line in Back to the Future where Marty's trying to convince Doc that he's from the future. He's, I'm from 1985. And he's like, who's the president? And he goes, President Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. And he goes, ha ha, the actor. Ha ha ha. It's like, <laughs> it's like Donald Trump, the guy for The Apprentice? Yes. <laughs> well, The Simpsons predicted uh, Trump being president. You know, yeah. th th that was goddamn funny. But, we, you know, um, ab about uh, about uh, Trump, you know, they, they're never going to allow somebody like him to become president. again. You know, they, they the 18 election was crooked. Um, the 20 election was crooked. Uh, the the um, the 22 election was crooked. They're they never going to allow uh, true democracy. You know, if the Americans, if, if the American electoral system were in any other country, the United States would call it undemocratic. Because it is, mm -hmm. it, it just, it, it's just completely corrupt. And, and everybody's like la di da about it. So you get to a point where you say to yourself, you know, is it the fault of the leadership or is it of the people who are just blase and just accept this shit? And so my thinking is that, you know, whatever happens to the United States, it's the American people's fault.
because they didn't have the gumption or the balls to actually stand up and do anything about it. And if there are Americans uh, watching me or listening to me, you know it's true. And you say, oh, you know, but the, the FBI infiltrators and this and that, uh, there are lots of ways that you can organize and, and, and lead to some real change. But the American people don't have the balls to do it, apparently. You know, so I, I, don't, I don't have it. I mean, there comes a point, okay. I think they have if you are victimized, if you're, if, you're, if you're victimized, that's a tragedy and you're the victim, sure. But if the victim keeps coming back for more, then who's at fault here? Okay, I mean it's as simple as that. It was like uh, you when Bush screwed up fool me once. Wife. Shame on you. Fool me twice. Yeah. Gee, uh, he couldn't figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> fool don't me say twice we have in Texas. Shame on the other guy. You don't know because you're from Connecticut. But uh, <laughs> he he just like well anyway he ain't gonna fool me anymore. <laughs> it's like damn dude. No, I won't get fooled again. Mm, yeah, no. Like, look, there comes a point where the victim had it coming because they were dumb enough to put themselves in that position. And, and, and that, that's my feeling about the American people. Although there is the possibility, and I think it's a real possibility, that there could be at some point when the whole shit show goes up in smoke, when the dollar just really hyperinflates, as it's going to, it is going to hyperinflate. I mean, the, and the kind of chaos that we're going to see is just off the charts. Then, you know, all kinds of shit might happen. Uh, I do believe that there's going to be some sort of civil war in the United States. I, I, I do believe once Last the currency war. crashes and the rest of the world just disengages from the United States and just wants nothing to do with it, that all kinds of horrible fucking things are going to happen in the continental United States. I mean, I'm talking like, like organized warfare, like all kinds of shit, okay? And I think that's going to happen. And I think that people don't really believe it because they think that that's like impossible you wait well, you as wait. bad as it seems it's actually better than it was right after 9 11. and i'll try and make this case it's like okay okay this is this is just let me okay, it's is, bad i'm not saying it's not bad i'm saying it's again. better i'm okay. saying it's better than it was if you look at the propaganda for the first gulf war there was zero resistance it was yellow oh, yeah. ribbons okay. everywhere around right. okay then you go to the second Gulf War because of the internet. There was massive protests and stuff. It just didn't work. But it's the most unpopular war since Vietnam because it was like, right. you lied about WMDs. That is like admitted. Like, yeah, you fucking lied and got us in a war. So because that went so badly, then when it came to Syria, a lot of people got on the phone. It's like, no, no, we're not going to Syria. So no boots on the ground. They, they used ISIS as a proxy force. They still disrupted Syria, but they couldn't get the invasion like they did in Iraq. Right. But it was mostly still the people, and it was just like maybe Ron Paul and two other. Then with Ukraine, we have 22 congressmen and 11 senators that oppose giving them aid. So that's 22 times more people than we had for Iraq or Syria, right? Like yeah. to get a congressman was something. To get a faction and 11 senators, that there were zero senators in the past, right, who were like, no, I'm not giving aid to Ukraine. We have more to work with now than we ever did yeah. before. And I think it's because yeah. each each Libya was a disaster. Like each disaster, not everyone's a goldfish brain. And so I see the other side, the anti-war side, growing. They're not winning, but it went from zero to now 22 congressmen, 11 senators. I hope that projection stays where the populace continue to get in power, at least in those races, and can prevent a collapse in civil war. And that's my hope. But. Well, my, my thinking is this, um, in 2023, the Americans are going to kind of like realize the, the Ukraine situation is a lost cause and they'll just memory hold it. They'll just turn away and just memory hold it like Afghanistan. Like it never happened. Just yeah. forget it, ignore it. It just went away. And the Russians will have their way with Ukraine, but uh, they'll pivot away from Ukraine and turn all their attention to China. Already, Taiwan. like I read this very interesting. Troops. Uh, yeah, they, they, not only that, I read a very interesting uh, piece written uh, on an Indian website uh, that I, I forget the name of it right now, but I'll send you a link if you want. But they were talking about the hysteria about um, American media focusing on China now, uh, you know, and, and all this talk of China, China, China. Yeah, in 2023 and into 2024, especially the anti-China rhetoric is going to go off the charts, laying the groundwork for a war with China in 2025 that will you know the, the sanctions i think against china are really going to start in 2024 
and they are going to blow up in the face of the United States, something awful. Just like the sanctions blew up in the face of the Europeans, the, the sanctions against Russia blew up in the face of the Europeans, the sanctions that the Americans will impose on China will blow up in the face of the American economy. And out of the desperation of that collapsing living standard and economic situation in the United States, they're going to go a whole hog in the uh, China war in 2025. I think that that's the direction of travel. And I, th I think that you know, the, the war in China, because there is also going to be the explanation that, oh, yeah, land war with Russia, you know, the Russians are always going to win. But a war with China, it's going to be a naval war. We've got all these aircraft carriers and shit and all these bases there so we can take on the Chinese. And the Chinese are prepared for those aircraft carriers. They're, they're itching to sink at least one preferably four it, what they don't American get is i think the american navy can take the chinese navy but you don't fight water versus land forts always exactly. beat ships like that's, that's duh. exactly yeah, like, exactly you know yeah and, and also, china the made some, is, they just did man-made islands they're like sink this you can't it's an island no there's also another problem too that people don't seem to understand that the technology has changed radically over the last 30 years with these missiles these hypersonic missiles and don't kid yourself, the, um, the um, Chinese and Russian weaponry is far superior to the Americans. Um, for instance, I, I can point to a specific instance. Uh, at the start of this conflict in early March, March 7th or 11th, I, I keep forgetting, the Russians struck the uh, base at Yavoriv in, um, in, in far western Ukraine. I thought that was on March 20th. Because I remember saying March eleventh or March twenty. Was it, it earlier? I thought they did it on the anniversary yeah, it, of the rock. It, but... it, it doesn't matter. The point is that see, they they hit it hard with hypersonic missiles, and the Americans didn't even see them coming. Because they didn't from what even I know how many were used. They're like ten to twelve. Yeah. They had no clue. Yeah, they, yeah. In one go, they killed four hundred of those uh, NATO troops that were there that were laying the preparation for for more NATO troops. They killed the off four hundred of those men. It. Yeah. And uh, yeah, and four hundred million dollars worth of gear in one go, mm -hmm. in just the one hit, and that sort of like marked the territory. And the Russians said, "Don't right. fuck with us because we got what it takes to really hurt you." And what scared the Pentagon, and I've heard this from multiple sources, is that the, the Pentagon, their, their intelligence uh, satellites and so forth, didn't see these missiles coming because the way these missiles travel, they travel so fast that. Um, it basically creates, it compresses the air in front of it and basically creates a plasma shield that uh, radar or most radar cannot detect. And so uh, that, as I understand it, I'm not a tech guy. I, I don't know the specifics of it, but they didn't see these missiles coming. And uh, the Chinese have boatloads of these missiles that are specifically designed to sink aircraft carriers. Yep. Now, the Chinese want that because of the 1996 thing that Bill Clinton did, a parading one of the carrier battle groups right through the Strait of Taiwan as a big fuck you to the Chinese, a humiliation to the Chinese, and they're still not over it. You know? I don't think it'd be a, a carrier war like World War II. I think the main thing they'd have to worry about is the submarines just shooting cruise missiles at them. So whatever. Like, we don't need a war with China. It's not going to go well for either side. That would be a fucking disaster for the whole Earth. But there are people like Jack Posobiec that wants to fight Russia and China at the same time. And Adam Kinzinger, who... <laughs> I just retweeted a screen cap of him talking about the ghost of Kiev being Sam Hyde. <laughs> yeah, that was funny. That was goddamn funny. That was, you know, oh man. That, that's that's the guy on the grassy but... knoll too, right? Samuel Heidstein, wasn't that his name? Mm. That's such yep. a great meme. Yeah. A great comedian. You know, like what a I weird. When I heard the, the ghost of Kiev thing, you know, on the, like the very first days of the war. I'm like, what is this? What are you talking about? Six planes and then fuck man what are you talking about yeah it's just and eventually uh, they admitted it you know and like it's a big goof and there were people who actually believe this shit there are people who still, still believe it this still yeah. is the same people that believe in Co ghost of kiev or like the video game footage that they were using saying look at us killing these russian tanks it was from some game are the same people that think kyle rittenhouse shot a bunch of black people <laughs> like even after the trial oh yeah right? yeah. But, uh, yeah that's why like yeah. And I see these videos, these women that can't name four countries. And I'm like, it's over, America. It's like you you can't blame that all on drugs either. I'm like, how can you be an adult and be that dumb? Have you seen the meme going around that shows the, um, the, the, the questions that you needed to be able to answer to get a high school degree 
in 1910 or something like that. And you read the questions and you realize that some Ivy League graduate today could not answer them. Really? You know, that, that's a little, yeah, it, it, it was very amusing. Um, you know, it, it, and it was simple stuff or uh, things that I would consider as simple stuff, you know. Uh, you know, basic history shit, you know, when was the start and end of the Civil War? Shit like that. Shit that, shit that ought to be obvious, okay? Right. Yeah, but, you know, Ivy League graduates. I I went to an Ivy League school, and I remember back then in the early '90s how stupid they were and how ignorant they were of so. Sorry, I think I was muted. I'm talking to the ghost of Lyra right now because the Ukrainian government murdered him, and the American government allowed it. Many things, and uh, now with with the whole diversity, equity, inclusion bullshit, God knows how stupid they are now. And these are the people who are, who are being groomed. To be leaders of the United States. Oh, I thought you were going to say something else. These are people being groomed, period. <laughs> no, they were groomed in, in junior high. <laughs> yeah. Well, at least Florida, you can't do it till fourth grade. What a W. Yeah. Do you know that, that Emmanuel Macron was literally a, a uh, Rothschild's twink? He, he was literally a twink for the Rothschild family. I cre I'm the guy that created the meme with him in the Caribbean, you know, with his little boys, shirtless boys. It says, ladies, find a man that smiles at you the way Macron does at young <laughs> Caribbean adolescents. <laughs> Caribbean. Oh, you're talking about that picture of him with the African migrants, the shirtless African migrants? I mean, he looked hot to trot. Oh, God, yeah. You know that? Yeah, because like Santa Marin. He's, he's got a grin on there. his face like the Grinch, like that that Jim Carrey contortion, uh, you know, that weird face. And I'm like, dude, it's creepy. You're so happy to be with these little shirtless boys. Like, you know, you look like uh creepy. Yeah. But that's the kind of leadership kind of we have. Us. Unfortunately, I'm gonna have to wind, I'm gonna have to wind down because I gotta do some shit here. But well, that, um but it's, yeah, it's uh, even I'll, I'll you, just yeah, just to round out the conversation, you know, the the leaders we have today, they're puppets of other forces. Other people, like look at Victoria Newland, for instance. She is, you know, her 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 title is Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs. Just mm -hmm. sounds like some random bureaucrat, right? The longer the she's title, the, one, the more useless the job. Yeah, but she's the actual power driving the whole Ukraine program. She's the one, okay? As everybody has identified her, and and she's married to Robert Kagan who's you know <laughs> the founder of PNAG. yeah and, and and robert kagan's brother is frederick kagan who's married to kimberly kagan who runs the isw the institute for the study of war that's putting out all the war propaganda it's all a little circle robert uh, lied I, about I, the anthrax just, attacks in 9 11 being from the Prague meeting him and fred yeah, Burns. You know, yeah you know th these people it's all this little coterie of people who share um, a, 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 a heritage, a heritage mm -hmm. rather, that um, is divorced from that of the average American citizen or European citizen, for that matter, because the Europeans are being dragged along in this bullshit. And they have just, no more you know, compass. Yeah, and they put up people like Obama, like Macron, like Santa Marin, like Olaf Scholz, uh, who are just imbeciles, or, or Rishi Sunak in, in Great Britain. They're just, you know, part of this uh, of this cabal. They are the. Um, uh, Wardent retired Shabble, in New Zealand, Shabble I guess. Boy, or what do they call him? <laughs> I guess the yeah. meth got to her. Have you seen her? Like, look at her face from four years ago to now when she just. Resigned. Oh, Jacinda Arendt. Yeah, from New Zealand. You talking about Jacinda? Yeah, yeah Jacinda Arendt. Her oh, face just she sinks in, and in. I'm like. You know that maybe it's Maybelline commercial, like maybe it's methamphetamine. It's just like she's messed up, man. She looks like no, yeah, a weird she looks zombie. Bad. She looks like what happened to her? It happened to her. She aged um, like twenty years in the year. I don't know. Mm, it was all those booster shots. Yeah. I don't know. Looking knows, rough, man. Yeah, all of the all of these people, they are the puppets. You got to look at the strings and find out who the puppeteer is. That's the issue. Because yeah, the so-called leaders of the West are not the leaders of the West. Because in Russia, you, you look at you look at Putin, you look at um, at Lavrov and Shoigu, and they're the guys running the shit. They have agency in the West, exactly. right? Yeah, 
Yeah. They have agency. We have agents. Mm -hmm. You can steal well, that. You can Israel yeah, that well, if you want. You might like this uh, sweater I'm wearing today. Yeah. 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 They take that and recycle it as bribes. But the thing is, see, you notice shit and you're automatically uh, a bigot, a racist, a this, that, the other for noticing shit. Yeah. Okay? So why do they want you to not notice stuff? That's the question you got to ask because it's true. That's the thing. Because, see, if, if you say that the sky is green, you know, and it's obviously not true, and so you just ignore him. But if you say that the sky is blue and somebody's saying, no, 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 you're a bigot or this or that or the other, then. That's you know, a Sam Hyde-ism too, like for real, not, not making this up. Like Sam Hyde's comedy was like, how true does it have to be to be offensive, right? And so stereotypes aren't funny unless they're at least a little bit true, right? Yeah, there exactly. They are again. But I'm going to try and, and find it Mel Gibson it. meme. Um, I didn't want to do it while you're on, but I'll find it and I'll send it to your Twitter and do what you will with it. But I, I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Uh, well, it I hope you all get bombs. Come around anytime, and I will send you this is on Bumble. As soon as it renders, I'll send it to you. Peace. Okay. Uh, Take it easy. Not a greed mark. Proud producer and proprietor. Patriotic projectile party pop. Got some up in the brown people making trouble for your empire. Replace them with a charred freighter and a cloud of white smoke. So remember, if your next geostrategic boondoggle is going awry, don't call us. We'll what a delight. <clears throat> What a delight to talk to. They murdered that man. He was a good man. He was fun. He had good work. And they just let him waste away and die in jail. This can't stand. Don't let this drop off the radar. They extorted his money. That needs to be returned to his family. I would say they need consequences for all the people they've murdered, not just him, but many. That's going to come by way of Russia taking over their country. <sighs> the, the Biden administration makes me ashamed to have been born in America. And I'll see you guys. Well, let me see if I can read these. Did sap some people. Mace Leon since two says Lyra. Thank you. Ben 44. He made all videos for kids for years, including the CRP videos. But they are probably mostly lost now as he deleted them from YouTube and his laptops were seized when he was arrested. I think they're on alt censored. Shauna Fong. GL is a free speech martyr. No one can now say Ukraine is a country that respects human rights. No doubt. As a plumpet on how they're drawing government, yeah. P1 Dizzy, do you know why Ritter had an issue with parts of Lear's narrative? I do. I'll, I'll Not in this tribute video. I'll get into that. What happened was people were lying to Ritter about Lyra, and people were lying to Litter, to uh, Lyra about Ritter. And going, oh, he said this. And then they go to the other one going, he said that. And it causes conflict. But Ritter was acting on bad information, and so was Lyra. That's the short and skinny. And I I talked to Lyra about it. I haven't talked to Scott about it. Uh, I don't think he cares anymore. Let's see. All right, that's all the chats. We'll see you tomorrow. Peace.